Good evening, Epsilon meeting of Monday, November 22nd. Uh, we have all of council here, uh, and Councillor McMath is joining us virtually, and hello, Megan, and Councillor St. Pierre is unable to join us tonight. So we do have quorum, and so we're going to get right into this. Firstly, starting off with acknowledging that we are meeting and conducting our business on the territory of the South Nation. So Council, I'll turn your attention to our agenda today. So I'll look that uh, tonight's regular meeting agenda be adopted as circulated with the inclusion of the new business or supplementary items. So motion please by Councillor Logans and seconded by Councillor Lajeunesse. Any questions on the agenda? See none, all in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. So that brings us right into item six was our public and statutory hearings. And we have two development variance permits up first here. And each of these items have their own public input session built into them. And then we also have a public question and comment period for all other remaining items on the agenda. So when we get to these items, I'll call out for members of the public for those items in particular. And then if you have other items that you would like to bring to our attention, please save those for later on in the agenda. Okay, uh, so first off, we're gonna head right into item 6.1, which is a development variance permit for, I need my glasses, six, sorry, 6868 Beaton Road, which is not what's on the screen here. That was 6.2, 6.1, please. Thank you, so then I will turn it over to staff, please, to take us through the report. Thank you. Right, uh, we've received a uh, development variance permit application for the property located at 6868 Beaton Road. Variance uh, would enable an existing carport with deck to remain as currently cited. Uh, subdivision of the parent parcel changes the location of the front and rear lot lines, which uh, consequently results in the existing carport and deck becoming non-compliant. Uh, located near uh, Municipal Hall on the corner of Beaton Road and Pyrite Drive and adjacent to Broomhill Community Park, subject property is predominantly flat, is approximately 940 square meters. Subject property is currently zoned small lot residential R3 under the zoning bylaw and is designated community residential in the official community plan. The zoning bylaw defines a lot line uh, front as meaning the lot line abutting a highway other than a lane provided that where a lot is a corner lot, the front lot line is the shortest lot line abutting a highway. Based on this definition and because the subject property is a corner lot, the current front line uh, runs along Beaton Road. However, with the proposed subdivision, now shifts the front lot line to now run along Pyrite Drive, which is now shifting uh, the side lot line, flanking lot line, and rear lot line, and the setback requirement for each of these lot lines. A uh, land surveyor sites plan of the proposed subdivision of lot B shows that the existing carport with deck is sited 1.2 meters from the rear lot line. The area highlighted in red shows the portion of the existing carport with deck that now encroaches into the required 3.5 meter rear lot line setback. Uh, based on the information shown in the uh, image on the screen here, the shift in legal lot lines is due to the proposed subdivision I had mentioned for 6868 Beaton Road and the request for this variance permit to recognize the carport and deck to remain as currently cited. Uh, the variance uh, would result in a rear lot line setback reduction of 2.3 meters. Uh, denial of the variance request would result in the reconstruction and removal of the existing carport with deck currently attached to the existing uh, single family dwelling in order to enable subdivision of the subject property because the carport uh, with the deck would become non-compliant. Staff do not anticipate impacts to the view and enjoyment of immediate neighboring properties as a result of this variance request. Uh, and with that, uh, staff recommendation uh, is provided here on the screen. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Pardon me. Thank you, Mr. Paolo. 
I'll ask council first if there's any questions of staff on this application. No. Yeah. Go ahead, Council Brightman. Yeah, I th it's a very <coughs> good, clear report. Thank you. I'm just curious under this new Bill 26 um, whether this would be defined as one of the minor variances for which delegated authority would be given to staff. Would you um, it's my understanding that it's a requirement of local government to pass a bylaw similar to the delegations bylaw that we have for development permits. And within that bylaw, we would indicate what would be considered a minor variance. So each municipality may have uh, different minor variances that they term and provide for that delegated authority. All right. And just to follow up in, in, your, in your experience and wisdom, would this qualify as a minor variance, do you think, without being held to any answer uh, certainly it could uh, fall under uh, those criteria this may be uh, given uh, the amount of reduction it, it could fall beyond the the minor variance capacity but I think with everything there's different thresholds whether you use a percentage base to determine that or if there's a, a certain areas where uh, council is more comfortable with determining that, that flexibility for a delegated authority. Um, I, see, I see that as something in future for uh, staff and ultimately council to determine in that delegated authority bylaw. Okay, anything else from members of council? Seeing none, um, I'll look now to see if there are members of the public present who would like to speak on to us on the development variance permit for 6868 Beaton Road. Okay. Seeing no public coming forward, I'll turn this back to Council. Uh, it, it seems straightforward. Um, I'll list off then that the recommendation is uh, that Council authorize the issuance of Development Variance Permit PLN 01628 for 6868 Beaton Road to reduce the required, required rear lot line setback from 3.5 meters to 1.2 meters for the purpose of permitting an existing carport with deck to remain as sited. Moved by Councillor Logan, seconded by Councillor Beddoes. Anything on the motion? Go ahead, Councillor Logan. Yeah, I, uh, further to what uh, Councillor Bateman was stating, um, in any other circumstance, this might be beyond staff delegation, but I think in this scenario, it's, it's one that needs to come to Council because it is an easy one that we can see um, that all parties pretty much were probably in agreement to this in advance of it going or coming this far. So I'm happy to move it forward. Any comment, Councillor Beddoes? Yeah, I, uh, I went over and had a look at it and talked to the homeowner. Uh, I'm satisfied this is a very reasonable approach. Uh, I'm not too crazy about the subdivision that's planned there, but that's another issue. That's not what's before us tonight. And uh, so I have, I have no problems. I'm happy with this variance. Anything else? Councillor McMath, any comment? No? Okay. So, no concerns. I'll call the question then. All those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Moving on to 6.2 is a development variance permit for 4985 Souk Hangar Drive. So, same thing. Over to staff, please. Uh, districts received a development variance permit application for property at 4985 Soup Hanger Drive to permit the construction of a foundation for a single family dwelling to remain as cited. The applicants requested to vary the zoning bylaw uh, section for setbacks to water to reduce the required natural boundary setback to a water course from 30 meters to 24.58 meters. Uh, retroactive permitting of unauthorized constructions. Uh, always a challenge uh, and staff have conducted an extensive review of the building permit and development permit uh, development variance permit applications uh, located in the souk hangar strata subdivision development on the border of uh, machosen and the uh, east souk electoral area subject properties predominantly sloped with a small flat area near souk hangar drive uh, which is where the single family dwelling has been cited and is approximately uh, twenty thousand uh, square meters in size. The subject property is currently zoned uh, rural RU2 in the bylaw, zoning bylaw, and designated rural residential in the official community plan.
Is it changed on? It's still on the. It's still the same as that. Yeah. It, it's changed now. Okay, you guys have it on your screens. Okay. Um, in June of uh, 2021, the applicant's contractor applied for a building permit to construct a new single-family dwelling. The contractor proceeded with building the foundation for the single-family dwelling without the issuance of a building permit. During this time, the building department advised the applicant uh, contractor that a building permit had not been issued and that proceeding with construction was not authorized and would be at the property owner's own risk. As part of the building permit review, uh, the planning department requested that the applicant obtain a surveyor to review the built foundation for the dwelling to ensure that setbacks were compliant with the zoning bylaw. Uh, now the property owners have applied for a development variance permit to request a reduction to the required natural boundary setback to a water course, as mentioned from 30 meters to 24.58 meters uh, to permit the encroaching portion of the foundation to remain as cited. Uh, following provincial regulations, Corviday uh, identified that the SPIA for the water course that occurs within 30 meters of the property is calculated to be 10 meters. An environmental monitoring program has been identified as a requirement for the applicant to follow throughout the remainder of the development process. The province has accepted the SPIA setback recommendation and Corviday, uh, from Corviday Consulting dated October 6th of this year uh, under their uh, Repair and Area Protection Regulation Assessment. Uh, as per the covenant uh, on the property and part of the uh, building permit application, applicants required to provide the district of Souk with a certified geotechnical report prior to issuance of a building permit. Uh, the applicants retained uh, a geotech to complete this requirement. And uh, under section uh, six site setbacks of the report, they strongly recommend that house footprint setback distances be six meters from the south direction and three meters from the north direction from the rock slope uh, they've confirmed that the current house footprint marked on the site is meeting this criterion. Siting of the single family dwelling from the identified rock slope cliff as recommended by the geotech has resulted in a variance request for the required setback to the natural boundary of the water course. So what that means is that based on the geotech's requirements as stated in the covenant, the house needs to be sited in the location that has currently been constructed. And because of that, that now requires that setback from the water course because it's within that 30 meter setback. Uh, the site survey shows that the foundation for the single family dwelling is sited being uh, 24.58 meters from the water course. And you can see where that portion is uh, on the screen here for the area uh, requiring that variance. Uh, denial of the variance request would require either partial deconstruction or removal and relocation of the constructed foundation for the dwelling uh, based on where the single family dwelling has been sited in accordance with the geotech's recommendations. The location of the house is outside the SPIA setback of 10 meters supported by the province and there's no anticipated impacts to adjacent properties uh, to be seen. Uh, based on that, uh, staff support the recommendation as provided uh, in the council agenda. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paolo. <clears throat> so, if you field any questions, go ahead, Councillor Beddoes. Yeah, this, this is the staff. I, I'm a little confused as to um, why a contractor and, and an applicant would proceed with building a foundation without a building permit. It, it, can you shed any light? Well, what was the reasoning for proceeding with the the foundation prior to getting a permit. I assume that they asked for the permit and they started it while the permit process was going on or is, is that that's an assumption on my part if I could get some clarification there please. Uh, we've heard mixed feedback from multiple applicants uh, a lot of times citing uh, challenges with getting contractors in and timing so uh, at some times the applicants are uh, running a risk with gambling the anticipated issuance of a building permit hoping that the time that they're scheduling their contractors to come out and start construction on the properties lines up with the period that we're going to be issuing 
uh, those permits. In this instance, this was one where they uh, proceeded with development prior to that building permit being issuanced. And, and that, uh, that happens from, from time to time, and, and we have to uh, address that with the applicants, noting that um, we understand the challenges of, of getting contract help to come in, but uh, if they proceed with construction, they do so at their own risk. Uh, and can run up into instances like this where it might not be compliant. Okay, I, I guess what I'm trying, to, I'm not, I'm trying to determine here is if, you know, is it us, I mean the district, uh, holding up the process and the frustration that people start the projects without getting a proper documentation, or is it um, just the fact that these the contract was only available in this time? Um, because I, you know, reading the report that because of the archaeological uh, sites that it may take eight to twelve weeks to process the report, and of course you need the geotech report. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you know all the things that we're asking for are putting some pretty heavy delays, and uh, you know setting these situations. This is the second one we've had where the foundation has been put in, and uh, then they say, "Oops, uh, because of the the thirty meters." Uh, they come to us. I don't have a problem with the variance. It's a minor one. I'm just wondering if you know we're part of the problem or maybe we're not. I don't know. I just it just seems odd that uh, if I hired a contractor, that the contractors that I've ever dealt with in my time would be loath to start a project without a building permit. It just boggles my mind that they they go that route. But I guess that's not a question for you. <laughs> but I just wondered if you could throw some light on that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think uh, many of the municipalities were experiencing uh, a, a lot of development pressures and, and everybody, you know, wants their permit yesterday. And so of course, yeah. um, we, we do what we can to help uh, guide applicants through the, uh, through the permit process. However, there are instances like this and, and each applicant is unique. I, I, you know, I can't yeah. be certain what, with this one why, why they proceeded, but they did. Um, and we work with them to at least bring this forward to council um, to ha have an avenue to comply with our bylaws if, if council approves this tonight. Okay, thank you. Other questions from members of council? Go ahead, Councillor Bateman. So through you to Mr. Paolo. Um, so it's clear that this, the site, this is the one best site layout on the property, okay? So, so I have no problems at all with this pretty minor um, variance. Would, would this, in fact, in your professional opinion, be one of those minor variances that would not come to council in future? Just curious. Uh, I, I think there's criteria around this that we could state, such as with this one, that uh, it's received provincial approval for uh, the repair and regulations. Uh, so in, in those circumstances, I would be satisfied that it could meet that criteria if that was to be established through bylaw. Okay. And just one other point, in the draft OCP, I believe there's a section that's asking applicants before they, they cut into this streamside protection area to to explore all other options right reconfigure the site do whatever is possible is, is that correct the, we, we certainly want to minimize the instances uh, where variance requests are required um, so th with the draft OCP we are seeking to make sure all options could be explored because there's obviously good reason why those policies are in place to um, you know, prevent the need for variances, but we recognize each site is unique and, and certain uh, technical reports can justify why a variance is uh, required. In this instance, uh, it was for the purposes through uh, subdivision and then uh, covenant that a geotech report would be required and through that geotech report it highlighted that the house needed to be sited in a specific location. That unfortunately resulted in a need for a variance. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I do. Go ahead, Councillor McMath. Thank you. Um, through your worship to staff, you said that you have um, sort of a vetting and a review process for the retroactive permitting that comes through. What are the measurables for that? You may need to repeat that, Councillor McMath. So through your worship to staff, um, staff has stated that they have um, a fairly extensive reviewing and vetting process for retroactive permits that come through. 
and what I just want to know what the measurables are for that. Thank you. Uh, so what, what we're looking at is to determine in the instance where staff is putting forward a recommendation for support in the instance of, of this file that um, all necessary steps uh, that's required by the applicant to demonstrate that the house needs to be cited in this instance has have been explored. So in this instance, there was a covenant that was registered uh, on title requiring the geotech. The geotech's uh, recommendations needed to support the location for this as well as the uh, qualified environmental professionals um, report indicating where the setback from the water course was. So going through that process, determining that this building could be cited where it currently is, retroactively, how does that affect the current building there? If this was an instance where it was, it was mere preference over technical requirements, we would find that to be very challenging to support in those instances, also knowing that, you know, that they went through without uh, getting that building permit issued. Um, ideally, you wait for that building permit uh, review to be completed, and then we would get back and indicate what necessary steps are required to modify the site and then issue the permits once, once it's already in compliance. That step wasn't available because construction already began, so we work with the applicant to get a better understanding of the site characteristics that lend itself to having to be cited in this, uh, in this particular area. So they're, they're all unique based on whatever the, the reason is for why it's cited and the technical reports to support a variance request. This one was based on geotechnical and setbacks to water courses. In this um, singular application, it, it makes sense and it seems minor. The, the piece that doesn't sit well with me is that essentially you are, we are rewarding for practice. So when it comes to a contractor that goes ahead with construction without a permit, what are the repercussions for that contractor? And is this a strategic choice made by them with the property owner who may be liable? Are they fully aware of that? And it's a gamble because it's it sort of council gets stuck in this position where a homeowner is going to can be out several thousands if not hundreds of thousands of dollars so we're sort of forced when technically it's sound but like morally th this process right now is just is, doesn't sit well so in the instance where uh, applicants proceed with construction prior to a building permit and then we get to the stage where a building permit can be issued there is the assessment of double fees for that application as a penalty towards uh, proceeding with construction prior to the issuance of the building permit. So there's instances where that has been done where a variance isn't required, so staff administer that double fee process. In this instance, a variance was required. It became before council. If they receive the variance, then we can proceed with completing the building permit issuance process, and then they'll be assessed double uh, the application fees at that, at that point as the penalty. What's the dollar amount for that penalty? Uh, whatever the application uh, fee was for for this one. I don't have that uh, on my screen right now. Are you monitoring contractors that show the pattern of behavior? I, I don't have sp uh, specific information on each, uh, each instance and, and, and who are, um, I guess, what you're suggesting, repeat offenders. I, I don't have mm -hmm. that, that information right now. Okay. That's all for now. Thank you. Anything else? No? Okay. Anything else from members of council? No. Okay. So we'll turn to members of the public. And I will note that we did have correspondence received in favor uh, from a Ms. Tracy and Greg Gilks, I believe, that also reside on Souk Hanger Drive. So we do have that uh, attached here, a public record in support. Is there anything else uh, from members of the public that would like to speak on this item? You don't have to, but it's, it's up to you. Um, if you could introduce yourself and just turn on the microphone. There's like a button at the base there so we can all hear you. Hi, I'm Bonnie Ferris, um, one of the landowners. And yeah, um, <laughs> like you say, um, you know, we, we were sort of on the understanding that as long as concrete wasn't poured, it was sort of okay to go ahead. But, um, and as far as the development variance permit, um, yeah, we were sort of caught unawares of the 30 meter and it's common property for the strata next to us. And we are creating a really small footprint. Our house is going to be under 1,400 square feet. 
and the site is extremely tight and sort of difficult and we are not doing anything over on that side at all like you know septic everything else is happening on the other side and yeah we're really conscious of um, and concerned about the environment and are yeah sorry uh, and we apologize for going ahead thus far <laughs> that's it things happen Ms. Ferris thank you anything else from members of the public tonight Yep. This is the only time on the agenda to speak on this. So, yeah, I just need you to turn on the microphone just for our viewing audience can see you. Uh, just one on the microphone. Thank you. Hi, my name is Campbell Yates. And uh, my family and I are helping build the suit community for over 32 years. Uh, I'm uh, representing the builder. Uh, we got approval from the geotechnical engineer prior to the permit being issued and it was his understanding that everything had been prepared on the site per his recommendations and that we were proceeding with the form work, no concrete cast in anticipation of the permit. We weren't trying to jump ahead. We were just trying to take advantage of weather and the building season. So we weren't trying to cheat or do anything untoward in that manner. And again, as Bonnie's mentioned, what the drawing or the pictures don't show is that if you look up the driveway of the property, it's a crown of rock and there's very few places for the building to be sited. So it really was a, a fairly limited tight spot to put even a very small house, a modest house that they're uh, building. So um, again, we weren't trying to skip ahead or anything. It was just timing and we anticipated that the permit would be imminent. Um, and we were following all of the steps that we had to. The geotech signed off on the ground, all the compaction, all of the site prep, everything was done as per engineer's details and structural engineer requirements as well. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other members of the public? We're all good. Okay. Just double checking. Okay, so I'll turn this back to staff, or pardon me, to council, and the recommendation is that council authorize the issuance of development variance permit PLN 01618 for 4985 Souk Hangar Drive to reduce the required setback to the natural boundary of a water course from 30 meters to 24.58, so be from, not form there, meters for the purpose of permitting the construction of a foundation for a single family dwelling to remain as sited. So moved. moved by Councillor Bateman and <laughs> seconded by Councillor Logans. Any comments, Councillor Bateman? No, that's fine. Councillor Logans? Yeah, I think it's just a matter of uh, miscommunication and things happened and, and as Mr. Yates said, weather, it's really <laughs> impacting developments these days. I'm more than happy to move this forward. Anyone else? Councillor Beddows? Yeah, I'm uh, very impressed that uh, the contractor and uh, the homeowner has, has spoken up. Uh, I certainly believe them that there was no funny business going on <clears throat> and a very good explanation, so thank you for that. Councillor Lajeunesse? Yeah, I'm satisfied after hearing from members of council, from staff, and Mr. Yates and the applicant that uh, this is all above board, and I'm happy to move it forward. Councillor McMath? I'll be supporting the motion. I just, um, I not for this piece in particular, but if there's patterns and behaviors for contractors, I hope that that's something that staff is monitoring in the future. The thing that worries me if someone is building their first home and they're not as like versed in all the pieces and the requirements, I just worry if a contractor takes that risk on their behalf and they don't fully understand the consequences that could go along with that. I just, that's where I have some concern. Okay, it's a good concern, thank you. Anything else? So for myself, uh, I am in full support of this. I think there's been plenty of due diligence here. Um, seeing the site pictures, you know, others have just blown up the site and then blasted it all flat to build whatever. But here, there was consideration of the natural topography, finding a small fit 
print to fit into that isn't easy when you're working with uh, the natural surroundings. And, and it's a tough time right now. Uh, our departments are extremely busy. I hear of record building permits all the time. Our staff are trying to stay on top of these to move things along. Supply chain shortage, communication struggles, getting a contractor when you can, and the weather is certainly not cooperating at all. So, uh, you know, and again, I appreciate uh, all parties being here and uh, content, you know, this is well done work and thank you staff for bringing it forward. So I'm in support there and, and thank you for all the work. I don't think an apology is necessary, but thank you anyway. Okay, so I'll call the question. All those in favor, please. And that's unanimous. Thank you very much. And of course, all of you are welcome to stay with us through the rest of tonight's meeting. We'd be delighted to have you here in the audience. But if you have to leave, we understand too. <laughs>
and um, they're, they're in a position to put, um, put youth in contact with appropriate resources. We continue to participate with the Greater Victoria Diversity Advisory Committee to increase our understanding of the challenges we face in policing with individuals from different cultures, as well as individuals who've had different experiences with law enforcement. Still actively engaged with Crime Stoppers, and um, in the last reporting period, we did have a fatal motor vehicle accident within the district, which was, uh, has turned into a fairly significant ongoing investigation. We engaged the Island District General, Inva General Investigation section to assist us with that. And URSU, um, Integrated Road Safety Unit, continues to include SUC in their rotation, which if you follow uh, social media at all, they're quite well known when they actually hit town. And we, we usually know they're here through Facebook than we do through any other. Um, I, I apologize given, uh, given what was going on last week. I didn't get something in the agenda, but I have taken a quick look at the last monthly mayor's report that I believe would have been distributed to all of you. For the most part, in most areas, we're pretty much on track to what we were last year for, for offenses and call volume, et cetera. One thing that jumped out on me on the October report was that we had um, four theft of vehicles, which looks like a bit of a spree in our little town, but I dug into it a little bit further. One of them was a scooter. Uh, the other one was a travel trailer that a relative of the owner was staying in. One had just been towed, and the other was a vehicle that was left running in front of a liquor store. And, uh, Somebody took it for a ride home. So certainly not quite the, um, the rash of, of vehicle thefts that may appear on first blush. One thing I will point out on the monthly report, I know um, it's important to you to watch that, that spread between provincial files and municipal files. Our split, is, our split of members is 24% provincial, 76% municipal. We're almost always right on that number for call volume. You'll see that uh, this year we're trending to have the provincial a little higher. Um, there is a reason for that. A lot of that are um, files that are generated through the Ferry Creek protest. When there's the, the, um, the ones related to the injunction don't generate a file here, but if there's a criminal offense, it is a file that's generated in our detachment because it's our policing area, but it's not one we investigate or really do any work with. It just goes through our office. So I think we're going to see a little bit of an anomaly that makes it look like our provincial resources are being used out there more than they are, but it's not necessarily completely accurate. Um, lastly, just wanted to remind you about uh, our annual performance plan priorities for the current year that we're in. We're focusing on enhancing road safety, crime reduction, communication and visibility, and contributing to employee, employee wellness. Um, we're doing quite well in all of the, uh, the targets that we've established. Um, but the, the reason for bringing it up today is we're just, uh, just getting into our year of planning our priorities for the upcoming year, which will start in April of 2022. So as we, um, as we chat tonight, if anybody has any, um, any input from the community or yourselves, um, please share with me any, any thoughts you have about areas that you'd like to see your police force focusing on in the upcoming year. And we can certainly take that input into our planning process. We've got a lot of time. We've got until the beginning of April. So if it's not something that comes up tonight, um, anytime you want to have, a, to have a chat with me about it, I'd be more than welcome to, to have that conversation. And that's about all I have for my formal, well-organized presentation tonight. We're happy to have you, just given how busy things are in your world. So thank you very much for taking the time, and the informality is always welcome. We appreciate the time. Any questions from members of council, comments? Concerns. Go ahead, Councillor Bateman. Well, sure. So I, I would start with under your uh, enhanced road safety. It would be remiss, given the conversations at the stick in the mud, that we need um, speed enforcement, mm -hmm. right, to, to add to impaired, aggressive, and distracted driving. So speeding. And I know in this, in my three years here, we've we've had a number of uh, residents write about specific areas, Sun River Way, I think. Phillips and uh, Grant Road West yep. uh, in particular. Um, so I've asked this before, but w will this extra officer we'll be getting next year, which takes us, I think, to 14 SUC, RCMP, and then four provincial. Yes. Will that bring us to a 24-hour policing scenario? Not quite. Not uh, quite. We're, we're, when that body is here, we're two, we're two bodies away from being able to effectively and safely 
provide 24-hour coverage. So we're getting close, but we're not quite there. Right. And I think you, you, you've told us in the past 2028 is this target year where you'd like to see, um, well, I guess we have decisions here whether we meet the, the current ratio or the OCP ratio mm -hmm. or the provincial average. But um, are, are you still looking at that year and do you have a, do you have a preferred target? The, the reason 2028 came into some of the presentations that I provided is that that's a year we have population projections through the CRD. So that, that's just how we were using those numbers. Um, I, I think as, as we grow and, and we're having some renovations done in the building to support what I'm talking about, we need to, we need to get to the point where we've got that 24-hour coverage. Um, and that will also give us the numbers that when we get there, we'll be in a position that we can assign one person per watch because there will be four separate watches to focus on, one person that focuses on community policing, one first person that focuses on traffic, one person that perhaps will be the one that takes some of the more serious files that maybe has to adjust their schedules to stay on days or things like that. So um, as, as, we as the community continues to grow, we eventually we'll be in a position where we have a traffic section, we have a community policing section, we have a plain close section doing that work. But the way I envision it, um, as we try to keep up with population here, if we, we just get to that point where we have the bodies for 24 and then identify people on each watch to be responsible for those. And then we're going to have, we will have somebody focused on traffic unless they get pulled off to something else 24 hours a day. There'll be a day shift person and a night shift person and we'll, we'll just be able to focus on those priorities so much better. Okay, thank you. So, um, I have a number of other questions. Shall I carry on? I've, I've got, I'm curious about this category of mischief under property crime. What, what, do, what does that look like? Uh, mischief is a pretty broad category. Mm. Uh, mischief can be painting a bench. Um, mischief can be uh, interfering with somebody's, uh, with somebody's lawful enjoyment of their property. Uh, mischief can sometimes be the charge that we go to with some of these COVID, COVID disturbances. Right. Um, mischief cause disturbance, they, they, they kind of cross over, but mischief is a bit of a catch-all for, mm. for a, a, a behavior that is just disruptive. Yes, okay. Um, I, I was wondering, in terms of your current building on Church Road, um, when will it be time for Soup to consider, a, 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 you know, there's been talk around this council table of a, a sort of a true emergency services hub where fire, police, and ambulance come under one uh, in a new build scenario. Mm -hmm. do, do you, do you feel, are you at the point of near no return in that building, or what's, what's up? I, I, think that, um, I think the building meets our needs. The, the building is large. It's poorly laid out. As, as we change our service delivery to more of a watch system, we also end up in a position where we actually have less bodies necessarily there at the time because of how we're spreading our bodies out. Um, and quite frankly, from a detachment commander point of view, my goal is to have members on the road, writing mm -hmm. files on the road, doing their work in their cars. There's nothing, there's very little that they can't do in the cars that they can do in the building. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to have a shiny new building, but I would love to have shiny new policemen more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, finally, I just wanted to say thank you for, for attending our Sioux Homelessness Coalition meeting last month at the, at the Baptist Church. And um, it's been good to, to learn that Sergeant Shaw has established a really healthy, functional relationship with the Souk Shelter Society and that uh, that relationship is growing and evolving as we look at fresh challenges and, and opportunities to work with the Souk Shelter. So thank you for that. You're welcome. I had every intention of being there this Saturday, but I ended up working until 4 in the morning. You wouldn't like to <laughs> Not a worry. Not <laughs> a worry. You. Thank you. Other councillors? Councillor Lajeunesse? I have a question I'm not sure who this should be directed toward but we we uh, talked to the province last year about inclusion in the VIMQ and I'm just wondering where are we with that have we heard anything back or do we need to reinitiate that conversation because just um, watching the news of late it seems that uh, people are getting a little bit uh, more um, disruptive in in several areas and I think that uh, 
it's something that we need to stay on top of and, and find out how to be included in that um, VINQ. It's, it's still an active file for us. I think just given what's going on in the province, um, there's a change of federal government. Um, we're just seeing MPs start to return. Uh, the province is doing its whole review of the Police Act, and then now we're in a state of emergency provincial-wide, and we seem to enter into, we had one big state of emergency, and then we've had several others, it seems. Um, you know, really, if I wrote down this year, I don't think anyone would believe what happened uh, from heat dome to flooding to the Coquihalla is wiped out right now. Like, it, it's almost fictitious, but it's happening. Uh, so I think, meanwhile, we're, we're pushing against e-com and all of that. So there's, there's just a lot of pieces in the fire right now. So it's a piece to follow up on, I think, as some of these other pieces settle down a bit. Okay. Councillor McMath. Anything? Nothing, just to thank you for all that you're doing. You're appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else from members of council? Councillor Bateman covered off some of mine. I guess the couple that I had is with the new members that are joining the, attach the detachment, are they able to find housing? Uh, both of them were previously situated in the South Island and they're coming back to where they were. One, uh, one of them has a husband who's a member in West Shore and the other one was, uh, was already living here before he went to Depot. Okay, so that, that's really good news. Yeah. Um, the D.A.R.E. program, there used to be a program at the grade fives, I believe, in the schools where um, it was uh, Corporal Hilderly, I think, took the lead on that for some time, and then COVID, of course, has shut everybody out of the schools. But I'm wondering if you've heard of that program starting up again? So we, we did do one round of it in-house af after Corporal Hilderly um, wasn't doing it anymore. And uh, we skipped last year because of COVID, but Constable Haldane will be doing one session in one of the schools this year, and then we'll, uh, we'll move forward with what that looks like in the future. Okay, that's good. I think it's just to have that relationship building between the, the RCMP members and our young ones, I think is really positive going mm -hmm. forward. Um, whether they take everything away from what happens there, it's just having that positive interaction with an RCMP officer, I think is very valuable. Uh, and then I thought with Ursu that everything has sort of been pulled back into the core, like uh, that they needed the resources all to go back into Victoria, or if, am I mistaking that? It's actually the opposite. So Victoria, um, Victoria police have, uh, are in a position where their resources have caused them to pull some people back from integrated units. Um, and they've, they've actually had, as I understand it, I mean, um, I'm only reading this from the media, they've, pull, they've pulled from, uh, from URSU and some other agencies, so Victoria's not having the presence there. So there, there's probably less of that type of work in the core, um, but there's also less members doing it as a result of that. So there has not been a change for what the presence is out here. Oh, I see. Okay, I kind of read that that the presence out here would all go back into the core, but that okay, that helps. Thank you. Uh, and then otherwise, you asked the one on space, and and yeah, it's continually finding ways to build up the complement there. Um, I'll just share with mem with members of council that I did speak with a staff sergeant about how having additional members would enable the rotations and the shifts to all change. Uh, and that would attract even members who work elsewhere, who live in Souk, to actually work in Souk. But when you have anyone with, with families and dependents and other things to do, like to keep having long shifts and overtime and all that, it's a big commitment. So uh, we do have a real opportunity to get more live and work local by actually increasing the complement over time. And I think it's important to note that there is always a 24-hour response to anyone that calls. Yeah. And that um, we don't say when there's gaps in the coverage. We'll leave that to the staff sergeant to make that determination on his own, but I never want to reveal that, you know, between this time and this time, there's no one around like that. 
that doesn't do our, our community a service. We, we do have an excellent response here 24 hours every day a week. Uh, and certainly that's been the feedback. And then um, there's been some members of the community that have just reached out, um, just receiving a helping hand uh, from members of the attachment. So it's very much appreciated. And then going forward, I just worry a bit about the, the centers to Councillor Lajeunesse, it's just, it's getting really stressful for a lot of folks out in our community and and just tempers are flaring and mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's just a tough time all around and then with gas even fueling up and, and all of that, it seems that in Souk everyone was very respectful of mindful of the cues and the like, um, which I think is just the character of our community, but even then patients can be tested. So I know that puts uh, the crew and dealing with these really tough circumstances. So thank you for the work that you're doing. It must be a hard time. It's just layered with all of these things, one after another. We, we, the community, and me specifically, are very fortunate to have a very dedica dedicated group in this detachment. The majority of them were here before I was here, but I've never worked somewhere where pe where our members are truly as dead up committed to the community as this group here. And it's a lot of that's because a lot of them have been here for a very long time. And we're very fortunate that way. Well, that's fantastic. Well, thank you for all the work that you're doing and please extend our gratitude to everyone else in the detachment as well. And uh, we'll give some thoughts to the priorities that you're setting into the new year and um, keep that communication and the relationship getting stronger as best as we can. Excellent, thank you very much. Okay, take good care, thank you. Ms. Machado. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Our next delegation, unfortunately, had to present to two other municipalities. We were hoping they would arrive at 7.30. Can I suggest that Council make a motion to receive the delegation at the appropriate time when they arrive? We're expecting that they'll arrive today? Yes. They okay. were, we were expecting them at 7.30, but they've obviously been delayed. Okay, would that be a presentation that's done in person or are they attending virtual? No, they are attending in person. Okay, so why didn't they come here first? <laughs> well, Can't answer get, that. Probably trying to get a well, I don't know, okay, I'm just being a bit cheeky. It's just to your point on uh, traffic, right now everyone's complaining about all the congestion and how slow it is. And I'm like, who's speeding? Like, can you? No, but then it does leave those other roads that you clear where the speed does turn up so I mean part of that is reporting it through the calls for service um, so that our staff know that and then we've had some success with the speed the 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 speed reader board keeps getting yes. vandalized oh, probably a good mischief charge when we find out who those <laughs> culprits are there but go. good definition that's part of the problem with something that we move around is it does get damaged and then it puts it out of service and we have to wait again but it, it seems to have some effectiveness when it's actually up it does work anyway. yeah <laughs> so there you go excuse me your worship somebody did just pull into the parking lot so fingers crossed um, um, mr. McInnes is going to do a report of the CAO so maybe we, hopefully they'll arrive after that yep so we'll turn it over. Do you need a motion? We can just read, we'll just address it when they arrive. Okay, very good. Go ahead, please, Mr. McInnes. Thank you, Worship. Just a few quick updates uh, today. Uh, first of all, the extreme weather event last week, which we certainly uh, fared a lot better than other uh, municipalities, uh, communities uh, on the island and, and on the mainland. Uh, but we did open our EOC, our Emergency Operations Centre, from Monday until Thursday last week uh, to coordinate efforts. Uh, we closed it uh, late Thursday after we had a cross-departmental debrief and we did um, identify some areas uh, in the EOC uh, that we can improve upon. So it was good to have that debrief and um, we will uh, implement uh, some of the things that we talked about uh, before we closed it down. And just on the traffic issue, uh, today um, communica uh, operations and communications have been working hard to get good information out on uh, the traffic impacts. Uh, with the uh, two uh, major projects that we have going on. I encourage everyone uh, to go to the website. Uh, there's uh, some good graphics there with uh, suggested detour routes um, and it's been identified that uh, the period between November 29th and December 10th is really going to be a little bit worse than it is now um, as we get into paving and, uh, and uh, actually closing down roads so we can get some uh, new pavement on those roads. And the last thing I uh, have tonight on my list is uh, 
you'll notice uh, behind me, uh, Chief Ted Ryder, uh, our Director of Community Safety and Fire Chief, uh, has, has been with us for a week. It was a great first week with Chief Ryder, and uh, if you wish, Your Worship, I think Ted's uh, ready to say a few words. Excellent. Thank you very much. I was hoping you would conclude on that. So welcome, Chief Ryder, and uh, maybe turn the mic over to you, please. Uh, good evening, Your Worship and Council. Thanks so much for the introduction, Mr. McInnes. Uh, very happy to be here. Very excited to start my uh, next chapter, if you will, with Souk Fire Rescue. Um, as uh, Mr. McInnes said, uh, it was a busy, busy week. I was um, getting familiar with all the staff and meeting new people and doing my orientation and familiarization with the department and uh, then the floodwaters hit, so to speak. So. That was challenging for everybody, and uh, from what I saw, I wasn't really involved too much, but uh, things went rather well. And as uh, Mr. McInnes did say, uh, we identified some things in our debrief that we can focus on and, and get better at. So um, again, uh, looking forward to working with everybody, and uh, thank you so much for uh, making me feel very welcome. Excellent. Welcome to Souk. Glad to have you. Anything else, Mr. McInnes? That's it, Your Worship, uh, unless there's any questions that uh, members may have. <clears throat> Anything from members of council? Nope, I think we're good. Thank you. And welcome to the Capital Regional District. Time is impeccable. Thank you very much. I apologize. I made a joke. I'm like, which municipalities did they stop at first? <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, I'm going to give Mayor Martin a hard time. But that's OK. No, we're, we're glad to have you. And uh, you could head right into your presentation and please just turn on the microphone and introduce yourself. Thanks very much. Good evening everybody. My name is Glenn Harris. I'm a senior manager of environmental protection with the, uh, with the Capital Regional District. And thank you very much for the invitation to come out and just give us a brief presentation to uh, support the referral out to your, um, on this item on your agenda. Um, I thought maybe I'd just do a little bit of, a little bit of um, background, a little bit of process and maybe content and hopefully there's some time for questions. Uh, well, there's certainly time for questions afterwards and uh, clarification. So I don't have control of the presentation. Just while we're getting that go, I can just speak to it. So um, the board of directors at the CRD um, I wanted to show leadership on climate action. So they established a declaration of climate emergency. And concurrently, they said they wanted to take a leadership role in that. So staff went away and took that direction and came up with a new strategy. And so there was an older one, 2017, a regional community a climate action strategy, and there was a 2016 corporate climate action strategy. And so like many of the big uh, organizations, Metro and others, we combined it into a new document. It combines it. And so that's what we brought forward. So hopefully this is a strategy that takes us forward with climate action, meets some of the targets and objectives that the board has given us direction on. So. So I'll continue that on process then, just as carry on. I think I, hopefully I can speak to it, and if you indulge my little um, ad hoc, that'd be fine. Thank you very much. Um, so when we, so the CRD provides services on behalf of local governments. Um, we got a board endorsement on the strategy, and concurrently they said, okay, to actually implement the strategy, we need to have a lift in the established establishment bylaw. So we have a climate action service bylaw that gives us authority to provide that service on behalf of the region. And so it received first, second, and third reading at the October board meeting. Um, so that allows us to be referred out to local government. So two-thirds of all participants in the service need to approve a requisition or increase in the, in the service. And so that's what this referral is about, for it's for your consideration to allow us to increase the regional service on behalf of uh, local governments. That's great. Thanks. There you go. Oh, so I, I'm not doing this? Oh, perfect. <laughs> I just wanted to speak just briefly about the service itself. I just wanted to emphasize that it takes a supporting role to local governments. It's supposed to collaborate and cooperate with the intentions and the objectives of local government services and, and, and planning, as well as align, hopefully, with senior levels of government, provincial and federal. And so the idea is to com collaborate and com complement, not to compete with local governments. And so that's a big part of the service. It was a small service. When I came to the CRD in 2008, it was just established. There was one and a half bodies uh, providing the service. We're now up to two, and a, two bodies, two and a half bodies. Um, it's meant to, to provide the planning. You'll see that sort of plans and implementing programs and initiatives that benefit the region and uh, all our stakeholders and partners. 
It uh, does a fair bit of work on education and outreach. Um, that's a big part of what we do. We also do a fair bit of research, and you've maybe seen the, the efforts we do on greenhouse gas inventories that, that we, we share on behalf to the local governments. I'll just step back. Um, when we all signed the climate charter, the provincial climate charter, the province committed to providing biannual, so every two years, these greenhouse gas inventories so we could measure our success. Unfortunately, they didn't follow through with that commitment, so the regional government stepped up and provided that. So we needed a 2007 baseline, and then we're providing these inventories every two years um, that are available on the website. We share with the local government so that they can you can measure your success and track that because Bill 26 requires you to have these targets in your um, official community plans, just like we have one in the regional growth strategy. And then finally, um, the CRD has also got a large organization, lots of services, and there's a commitment to making sure that we meet our cli corporate climate action objectives too. So that was the service writ large, um, and that's where um, we've been to date. And then now with this new strategy, there needs to be a little bit of a lift to get some more resources to implement the next five years of this strategy that I'm going to speak to now. So. In terms of the actual strategy, there was a fair bit of consultation done. We had an external consultant work with us. We worked with all the departments and all the service delivery within the organization, but we also worked with the intermunicipal working group. So you have representations from all the participants at the staff level, and we appreciate uh, Sue's contributions uh, for that. There's also an intermunicipal task force um, that provides a council representation from each one of the participants. And so at the political level, we get to understand and share and, and, uh, and and provide information. So there's collect peer learning, but there's also sharing of, of the initiatives and priorities that are going forward, and then also understanding how we as a region, not just our local governments, but we as a region are working together in lockstep. Um, so we established some targets, so that's important to know. You have them in your OCPs, we have them in ours. We have a corporate target of 45% reduction of GHG emissions by 2030, and then net zero by 2050. That last target aligns with provincial, federal, and international targets. So everyone's starting to align up on our goals and hopefully how we're going to achieve that. The second one, the reduced regional GHG emissions, that 61% um, is embedded in the regional growth strategy. That was just an extrapolation from where we were in 2007 uh, to where we, we need to be for 2050 and where we're at right now in 20, or need to be in 2038. And of course, then there's some goal areas within the strategy. I think they make sense. Uh, one was just to make explicit this idea of climate, with embed, climate decisions embedded in all our decision makings, our plans, our actions, and uh, our, uh, our daily operations. There's this concept of sustainable land use planning and preparedness. That's more at the local government area, but certainly within the Juan de Fuca, which we provide uh, some governance over. Low carbon mobility is a priority, whether it's active transportation or a shift to EV mobility. There's a focus on low carbon and resilient buildings, and we can speak to that a little bit later too, whether it's the new construction being taken care of through the step code process, building efficiency, energy efficiency, as well as the existing housing stock. And specifically for this strategy in the short term, it's gonna be on the part nine, so the residential businesses, or residential buildings. And then the last two, this idea of a natural resilient ecosystem, we know how important that is to, to manage all the changes, whether it's the water cycle or um, changes the flora and fauna, agricultural shifts. So we're, we're trying to provide information and, and bring that together, make it applicable for the region. And then finally, this idea of minimizing waste, which is an important part of our emissions inventory as well. So this is what the pathway looks like out of the strategy. And so on the left, we have the emissions, and you can see our regional emissions up about 1.7 million. And then this time scale to heading towards 2050 and our, our targets that are in line, as I said, with provincial, federal, and international goals. And on the right, you can see sort of the steps. So there's, uh, there's several key steps that are needed. What's exciting about the strategy is we kind of understand the pathway, and it's a matter of coming together and actually trying to be successful and implement that, holding all of us accountable for our roles and responsibility, whether at the re in this case at the regional level and what the region can do to help facilitate some of this stuff. So the, the requisition lift in front of you today is really for that next five years. And they focus on this shift to uh, active transit modes, um, this uptake of uh, ZEV or electric vehicle mobility, um, and focusing on residential retrofits. And the other option, uh, the other big thing that continues on is this idea of converting from oil to heat pumps. So um, that seems to be the most logical technology for our region. But this idea of shifting our, our fossil fuel dependence away from oil to natural gas, to electricity, and the renewables uh, is part of the process, as well as some of these other steps. 
this next slide should just sort of be a little bit accommodated to, to Souk. That's right. I had staff just quickly put this together. Just give you a sense of the kind of data that we have and what we're trying to do. So in this case, you can see that there's a fairly low dependency on oil in this community, a fairly high dependency on gas, and of course electric baseboards. In terms of gas, I mean, that's one of the major heating systems, and there's certainly opportunities to improve efficiency with building envelope improvements via Fortis incentives, um, as well as a change to heat pumps. In terms of baseboard heating, it's one of the most expensive ways to heat a home, and we see lots of opportunity for cost savings, substantial efficiency gains, and increased resilience through heat pump retrofits. And we've been implementing that program or promoting that for some time. The other big thrust of the five-year plan is uh, the shift to um, e-mobility and EV. So in Souk, um, about just under 2% of all vehicles registered in Souk are electric vehicles and we think through natural progression we're going to get up to about 11 percent without doing too much but the provinces or the region has set a goal of 25 percent of the vehicles on the road light industrial light duty vehicles so cars SUVs uh, minivans of sort um, we hope that 25 percent of the vehicles on the road by 2030 will be electric and in fact through the clean BC program that the province has pushed out they want to be selling 90 percent of the vehicles in 2030 to be electric and so you can see that shift coming at the provincial and federal scales driving that to make that happen we need charging infrastructure in place across the region we know that 40 percent of the housing stock is not in single family dwellings where people can install chargers in their own facilities so we need to be conscious of that um, but we also make sure we, we need to understand the infrastructure that needs to be in place to accommodate that 25% goal. We've done the work in the last year and a half through the program, this roadmap project. We think we need about 1,000 chargers, um, about 150 of these fast chargers, and about 770 of the class level two chargers. That compares to the 10,000 chargers that the province has identified across the province to put this infrastructure in place. Um, so to make that happen, we need to coordinate that. And uh, we've done a fair bit of work. We've got the plan in place. We know what we need. The next step is to have someone in place to, to write the grants, to get the money that we know is coming from the provincial and federal senior levels of government to, through infrastructure grants to put in place. Uh, there's contract management. There's a lot of education and um, outreach required to sort of make people comfortable with this progress and this change. And so that's kind of the thrust of where we're going. So that's the basis of why we're, we're pushing and putting an emphasis on this. It aligns with what senior level governments have said are their priorities, and so we're just trying to be, make sure that we're in lockstep to support the region. That roadmap really looked at what's needed through growth and what's happening across the whole region, what needs to be in place for people to feel comfortable, whether you live in Souk and work in Langford or live in Langford and work in Souk. I mean, moving people around is really important, and so we've taken a holistic regional scale view for that. That's one of the advantages or uh, priorities of the program is make sure that we take a regional lens that benefits what you're trying to accomplish in this community and what we need to accomplish across the region. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention was just this idea of a corporate energy manager. That's the third aspect of what the, the requisition lift will accomplish. CRD has a lot of large services, wastewater, drinking water, regional parks, solid waste. We also have a lot of buildings to manage through the housing portfolio and through the health facilities. And so what we're looking at to try and increase the efficiency, the building efficiency or the energy efficiency of those services, hopefully to reduce costs and make us a more efficient organization, but also to meet our corporate targets and our objectives. And then hopefully there's lessons learned that we can share out across the, uh, the region with other local governments. So that's our intention um, with that position as well. We know we need, need to meet those commitments. This was an overview. Um, if it wasn't explicit in the, in the referral or in the presentation or in the, uh, the actual strategy document, this because it came up at the call with conversation. So we're trying to be as efficient as possible. So the first two, thing, two, two main components, that residential retrofit program and the EV uh, coordination, we're asking for a 0.5 FTE for, for each of those two positions. So one person is going to coordinate those two positions or those two major projects over the next five years. So hopefully a fairly efficient work, but um, we think that's doable. There's a lot of dollars there for outreach and education and program support. Um, we know that that's a real barrier for people understanding that. For those who know and are, are leading the, the conversation around climate change, we kind of understand where we need to go, but there's a lot of people that need to be brought along. And so the research that we've done, the business plan that we've done to support this indicates there needs to be a fair bit of work behind that. Um, 
I was just going to say from the residential retrofit, the emphasis there is on a concierge service. So there's energy managers out there in the community, different local governments have those or promoting those. A resident will get hold of that, needs to understand how to interpret that and how to move forward with all the incentives and programs and grants that are coming that way. And the intention of this position is to offer uh, residents um, concierge service, hold their hands to move them through that process so the uptake and the, and the and being able to do the right thing is easier on their behalf. And so that's the intent. So when you see large dollars associated, a lot of that's for program delivery. And so that's the intention of it. And then the corporate energy manager, that's the, that's the cost, the labor costs, and then some program dollars, whether it's the studies initiatives that we need to do to follow through. And so this is the question. And so you can see that this, the existing service was fairly small, $480,000. This is um, a requisition lift to a maximum amount. This is where we think we'll get to within the four, five years um, to support all the initiatives going forward. I know the boards endorse this unanimously. They're supportive behind it, but it does come up for referral to, for your consideration, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have from this. So thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you very much for the presentation. So I'm seeing some hands. Councillor Beddoes, go ahead, please. Yeah, I've made a few notes here. A very good presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm very, very happy that CRD is, is looking at uh, everything in depth. Um, I did notice you mentioned that, oh, sorry, through your worship uh, to our guest, um, that you're not in competition with the, each one, and yet you're talking about CRD grants for charging uh, level twos. And we're sort of looking at that too. So, where would be who best to put a grant in? Would it be the CRD or would it be the municipality here? Through through you, Mayor. Um, the idea is that we we're coordinating, understanding what needs to be put in place, who's doing what, and is there efficiency that we can put those grants in on your application and your benefit? So we, there may be some advantages from one program yeah. that show that we're coordinated across the region. We understand what needs to be in place and. Yeah, but we'd certainly do it in cooperation with our conversations through your staff at the Intermissible Working Group. So it's all done lockstep to make sure that we all understand who's moving forward and what the most efficient way is to accomplish our goals. And the same sort of thing with our, our Climate Action Committee is uh, recommending that we have a coordinator here for you know residential retrofits and things like that. But you're having one at the CRD that is doing basically the same thing. Again, is that another one that we need to be talking to make sure that we're not duplicating our services, that we're getting, getting the, I mean, we're going to the public. Same public pays those bills as pays the bills here. But it, um, you know, if you're going ahead with this much money, which is uh, a lot <laughs> compared to, to what our budgets are, I'm sort of hoping that we can, uh, you know, get some cost savings for us by utilizing the CRD service for some of these things. So that, that, uh, there will be an advisor there to, you say, a concierge, to, to help people navigate if they're going to get a heat pump. This is where you get your grants from. This is what you look for. Um, I assume that that's what you meant by that. Is that correct? Through Mary, that's exactly it. So the modeling suggests that we need about 3 to 5% of uptake of the existing residential stock to meet our target. We think there's going to be incredible demand for that. And so we've come out and we're targeting with this body to sort of a tackle about 1%. We think there's going to be a lot of need for this, and we may come back in two, three years and say, yes, we're being successful, and yes, we can't keep up with public demand, and so there needs to be a lift. And yeah, very, we're, we're going to coordinate enough. that yeah, through, yeah, through yeah. local governments and that. It's, this is getting the program started because we know that's where we need to go. It's probably why your, 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 your organization is already thinking about that as well because you, you see the writing on the wall, and there well, is conversations around Everybody that. is. Everybody Absolutely. wants to get on the climate action, and uh, my main concern, and I brought it up before, is that I don't want to see duplication of services. I want to see us work together and get the best possible service for, for the dollars expended. And whether they're CRD dollars or district of suit dollars, it still comes from the same taxpayer. You know, That's right. And, and so uh, the grant application, that we've done this in the past through this program and several other programs where there's an efficiency that we do the grant on your behalf and we identify the charges that your community needs, Colwood needs, Machosa needs, okay. city needs, and we put in one coordinated package, and it, it's a much more, it's a cleaner, more efficient way to apply for those funds. Okay, and all right. Thank you. Thank you for answering those questions. Okay. Other questions? Go ahead, Councillor Logans. Yeah. Uh, thanks for coming here and presenting to us tonight. It's a busy night for you. <laughs> um, a lot of this is pretty fluffy to me, and I don't put any blame on the CRD for that. I think that the province targets are bull. And 
I don't see anyone being a leader who matches the targets. So that's sort of where I come at you with the fluffy comment. Um, my, one question I have is regarding uh, mobility. Goal three, you have a lot of mobility issues listed or um, actions listed. And I would like to know which ones you think will benefit Souk the most. Obviously, we're just getting a blip, quick overview of these. So, um, so they're, I mean, you could ask questions for hours about each one. But, um, but where do you see uh, these actions most benefiting Souk, especially in relation to getting cars off the road? Because mainly what I'm seeing here is more vehicles on the road, but just hoping people have the funding, like the, the money to buy an electric vehicle. And, um, and hoping that electric vehicles will suit the needs of people who require uh, vehicles for transportation. Like, when is an affordable seven-seater minivan coming out? Um, <laughs> to get our kids to and from lacrosse practice. I would love to see this entire thing run past um, a group, group is the wrong word, past many young people to see what they would have to say about it um, because I think they would tear it apart <laughs> and ask for a lot more. So through you, Chair and Mayor, um, I think there's various levels that is being t tackled. So part of the, um, this idea of mobility is also about active transportation. And so as you build your complete community and you sort of build up your community, you're looking at for alternatives, more walking, biking, transit. So those are conversations a little bit outside of my service area, but they are happening at the board tables, advocating to the province in terms of planning around trans transit uh, mobility as well. Um, what we're trying to do is say, we're trying to get off, re reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We know that mobility is about 40% of the emissions in the region. And so providing, um, we know that the province is also moving and the feds are moving towards promoting electric vehicle mobility. So as those options come on the road, and so that seven-seater electric vehicle comes on the road and families want to purchase it, we need to have the infrastructure in place so that they can make that, confident, that choice with confidence. And so that's really the strategy behind that. Um, people are going to choose to work and live, and that's a a bigger concept than that so working from home or, or you know that's going to be a bigger thing for that younger generation to think about as they make their choices about lifestyle and that but for those that need a vehicle move we want to make sure that the infrastructure is in place so they can make the choice if they want to to move to an electric vehicle choice or option right and that's fair and that is necessary and that's where I see this being so basic because we need to go beyond that how are we supporting families who won't be able to upgrade their vehicle to a brand new electric car and and yes there is active transportation but that doesn't get your parent from souk to the base in a squimalt every day and that's the hugest area of traffic that we need to tackle so and that goes through multiple regions in the crd so how are we working together to make sure that all of the traffic that comes from Souk and collects through all those communities along the way to get to the base and up to San, uh, Sid Sydney Saanich area. How, do, how, are we getting, how are we fixing that problem? And oh, I don't see that okay. here. I'll answer that. Um, you may recall that um, the CRD did look to establish a transportation service because we're 13 municipalities and three electoral areas and are we all talking to each other all the time? And uh, so it seemed that, okay, like we need to come together here so we can put some regional cohesion cooperation together on this. And uh, it got turned down by the councils who want more autonomy. So we have the transportation committee that's back up and running. There is also a staff-based committee that would meet alternating. So at least, um, so that's been formed as well so that uh, the staff, and I know it's I kind of ask, like, every month, does our staff have capacity to meet every month? But we'll figure it out. Um, but just so that dialogue is occurring in the absence of a newly established service. So we're kind of, that's a very good question because we're still stuck. And we will continue to be stuck yeah. if we keep approving plans like this to go ahead. 
yes, it's good, and yes, this needs to happen, but it's not good enough, and we're beyond the point where we need to say, oh, that's good enough with climate action. So I, I honestly don't care that, uh, that there's baggage in history. It, someone needs to step up, take leadership, and say we need to make some real changes. And if it means that the CRD's role is to go to each municipality and say, listen, this is why it was turned down and we need to make a bigger change and, and tackle it again, I'm glad to hear it's back up. But it's, it's not, I don't know that it's back up because this board is reaching the end of its priorities. They did come out, they did right. Counts, our council voted against it. Even though our commuters commute the greatest distance, I was outnumbered when that vote came forward. I supported it at the board, but council shot it down. Not this council, but it was shot down. And then, uh, and then it just, let's approve more development and here we are today. So I totally yeah, hear you, I, Council I hear Lewis. you, and I don't accept your answer. <laughs> Thank you. I don't have an alternative because we don't have a new service in the works. So it's making the best of what we have. I can't wish the past was different, and I can't wish things were different. They are what they are. So here we are. It is. And for those that are commuting right now, it's an absolute nightmare. And I would just add, Mayor, just that, I mean, so the board's taking an advocacy role, and so they're lobbying the province, who does have control of transit organization and planning, to consider the, some of the questions and concerns that you're raising kind of thing. I would say also, too, that the province and, and the federal governments are to facilitate those families, you know, to, to move towards EV, because that is coming. The province has said 90% of the cars being sold in 2030 will be electric, because those choices will be there, that there will be incentives to hopefully assist those families doing that. Other questions or comments? Councillor Bateman? Yeah, so thanks for the presentation. And yeah, I agree with Councillor Logan's that, uh, yeah, we, we need greater and greater urgency, but governments move at, at the pace they move. And at least we have this 2008 establishment of this service, and now we're, we're bumping up the, the, uh, the, fu uh, the funding of it dramatically. Perhaps not dramatically. Maybe that's the wrong word. It, give me an answer. Is, is it a dramatic increase to move from this 400 to 1.7 million? It's so, rather subjective. That's I rather know, subjective. Course, but that's it's why it depends. Mr. Well, it's, Harris is. It's a three time. So, in, so your average cost per average residential is, is going from about 2 250 per average household to about 750 per average household. So the average household will contribute $7.50 to this service to provide this regional service on our behalf. So. Um, in terms of urgency, I just would speak to it. Offense is just the shape of the curve. We kind of know the target of 2050, where we want to get to, where we're net zero in our carbon emissions. And so it's the shape how quickly you want to get there. And so we've created a path based on, as you said, government, not inertia, but just the way we go about things and trying to address it you know, in a democracy. And so that curve, the board's comfortable with that path, and we think that's within our control. This is where we're going. What I typically get asked at other councils is, what if we give you more money, can we go faster? And the combat I've come back with, philosophically, I don't think that's going to help us because we've got a five-year plan to get us through these things and, and just to get the federal and or the senior levels of government aligned and, and coordinated so they can implement their programs and we can go lockstep with them. They'll address those if we're successful in these five years and start to see some real action. Then we can move on to the next part of the thing. And that's when the federal and provincial governments, which really have roles and responsibilities that we need to lockstep with, they'll be ready and developed so they can implement their, those programs. If we get too far ahead of them, we can't make changes on those aspects of the, of the strategy, the pathway that we need to tackle. So we do have a plan. I think people are feeling confident that if we can implement that and hold um, each level of government to their roles and responsibilities, we should be successful, or at least get a long ways towards that goal. Now, I'm going to carry on and moving into um, community GHG emissions inventory. Now, we're anticipating this in first quarter of next year. Is that correct? The updated one. So the CRD is committed to we did the baseline because we yeah. didn't get the 2007. And every two years, yeah. um, we're getting So we will have the, most, the latest data for you uh, in Q1 of next year. And that year. will be for 2020. That's right. And it, as a COVID year, is that, do the numbers become a bit... Um, I guess we'll see. We've seen that in other aspects of services and that, so we will we'll certainly see some reduction, I would think, in transport and, and transportation, yeah. but um, it'll be, yeah, it'd be uh, crystal balling it at this point, but we may see some reduction. And we'll have a context for that and uh, in terms of the overall trends that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
in terms of um, this corporate energy reduction strategies, now here in Souk Sea Park, right. now I, know, I understand the number of projects are planned there. Can you give us some update on that? So, so I didn't bring my list of all the, and I okay, apologize I for you. that, but I know that Sea Park, which is run by the CRD, has got, they're real committed to reducing their GHGs, so the conversion of the boiler and some of these other efficiencies. Okay. Yeah, they've already done the lighting, I believe, and uh, yeah. yeah. Now, the Regional Building Energy Retrofit Program, so I'll, I'll bring back Councillor Beddoes' comments. Um, you, you have a concierge service um, for a single employee dedicating half of their time to, um, I'm wondering how does one determine where that energy will go in terms of you've got 13 municipalities and two regional districts, what can Souk expect in terms of its share of, uh, of attention from that concierge? Yeah, fair enough. So that concierge service is actually going to be delegated down to a nonprofit to deliver that. So you can't imagine that one person can't reach, you know, 100,000 households in the region mm -hmm. and we're looking to tackle and change one percent of that there's just too right. many so we're going to have we're going to partner with uh, city green city. or some other nonprofit to actually deliver the program and have s multiple um, uh, champions to actually help citizens and residents uh, make that conversion and so the intention it will completely be equitable and the numbers will be tracked so we understand which communities and which citizens are taking advantage of that right and you are already tracking to a degree through the bring it home for climate program, how many people out in Souk are taking advantage of that at the moment? I apologize, you know? and I can bring those numbers back to make sure that uh, you have that information in front of you. Okay, because I do know in your in your report you've noted uh, 400 homes in the region, 400 homeowners um, have taken up with very little marketing in the last year. And that, why was there very little marketing of that program? Through, through you, Chair. Um, so. It was a small pilot project. The intention was just to be a pilot project. It was, mis it was matched up with the Transition 2050 initiative at the federal level. They wanted to see if this kind of model would work. They've done the work and said, yeah, that's, that's the business case in support of why we're going to move forward with this concierge service because it does work helping householders on an individual basis. That really seems to be the model that's going to work. They've done the research and globally, and we see that's the best model for having the uptake of that objective, which is to get homeowners of existing building stock to retrofit their buildings for energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate the PACE programming making a significant difference in terms of getting to your 3% annual target? So that's a conversation around financing that we'll see if that's, you know, I like the model. We'll see whether or not senior levels of government take that up. And that's a big part of the conversation next about the financing. And we've backed off on any recommendations because CMHC, FCM, uh, Environment Canada are all looking at different models of financing. Even the province is looking at that. So until we get some clarity, we're just waiting, waiting yeah. to see. But we can move forward with this pro part of the program, knowing that the PACE program or some kind of financing model that helps homeowners do those retrofits and realize those benefits um, is coming pretty quickly. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to, to, to let you know that the District of Souk has recently, just as of last week, brought in a Climate Action Coordinator intern who will be with us through August, and then our budget proposal we'll be looking at tomorrow night does include funding to uh, continue that position. Do, do you see, what, what advantages do you see to having a municipal climate action coordinator working with, with your, your team? And yeah, tell me more about that. Absolutely, so through you, Chair. Um, again, we're meant to complement and cooperate and, and collaborate um, the work you're doing, so we take for example, just in the, in the area of, of the research. So we've taken global model predictions of climate change, downscaled them with work we've done with UVic and other academic institutions to make it regionally relevant. So the idea is then we share that with the local government who can then take that and implement that into the services and operations that you participate in at the local government. So it's all about trying to complement and give you information. Um, we've got various outreach and education programs that would complement what you're trying to accomplish in the region and just trying to give you information or support you or promote yourself through our platforms to raise awareness for what's happening in Souk and what you're trying to accomplish. So that's the point of the Intermissal Working Group. Your representation understands what we're trying to accomplish and your staff will come forward and say, this is what we're working on, how can we work together and how can we support you? And so that's what I'm trying to make sure happens. Um, so Again, so we're, the more capacity you're building at the local government just gives you more strength in your community. We're just trying to complement that and fill the gaps where possible. Okay. 
And I, I think that's about it for now. Thank you for your work. Um, yeah, and, and then, okay, let's go back to that um, retrofit program. So I see you were targeting oil heated homes constructed before 1940 and pre-1990 gas heated homes. Um, and then there's the situation of this rapid increase over the last decade of homes in the capital region adding natural gas furnaces. So you're, and I know BC Hydro is seeking to drive more and more of us to 100% electrification. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on um, moratoriums on LNG hookups within communities as they're doing in Vancouver, for example? So we understand the conversation. What my role as a staff would be to bring that up through uh, through executive to the board and to the environmental services committee for them to consider their position and if they want to advocate a certain position on behalf of the organization so staff would certainly be part of that conversation we'd be certain the pros and cons of what's going on and inform our politicians our board about a position they may or may not want to take so you don't have a position at this point on well what we're hoping to see is a shift from uh, of different energy sources so so a shift from oil to natural gas is better and a shift from natural gas to renewable energy electricity would be even better and so it's about where we can see the best plants and so when you refer to the uh, different housing types those are called archetypes and so the business case identified which parts of the residential sector were most likely we're going to see some success if we target those areas for energy efficiency upgrades and so BC Hydro, Fortis, the province and the federal government will target the incentives for those areas. And so we're just going to facilitate that conversation and our outreach will be focused on those areas. And then just one final question. It's in the, the actual details. Your microphone. Yeah. In the actual details of the amendment, there, there were the two funding models, right? So there's the up to 1.74 million mm -hmm. per year and then there is a per capita or of, it's like zero 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 point nine four, so some number such as that. Would opting for that option deliver significantly more funding, or no? So the one point seven four million is the cap, and that what you've described as the household. That's the increase per household. So how we evaluate the requisition is on a on a roll. So we look at the. It'll depend on the the number of rolls and that, and so that's the application of the requisition onto their levy. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Councillor Bateman. Other questions from members of council? Councillor McMath, anything from you? I guess, please. Um, I just have one question. When Suke joins large, we'll call them group projects, um, typically they're, they're left to the end. So priorities are given to the larger, older, more populous municipalities. So how are you guys sharing your resources and your support between municipalities? So through you, Mayor, um, the intention is to be as equitable as possible. And so there's no target areas. We look at regional services that, that would benefit everyone and it's not discriminatory in terms of different regions or local governments. And so um, the numbers are there. So if, if we're tracking the number of households taking up the benefit, we will be evaluating that on a yearly basis to make sure it seems equitable and course correct if there's any reason for why one community versus another is not seeing some benefit. So my sense is that, I mean, one of the objectives or one of the, the, yeah, one of the objectives is to make sure that it's an equitable service and we're a regional service and we need to support and show support to all the, all the participants. Are you going on a first come, first serve basis? How are you triaging the requests that you get from communities and how are you prioritizing them? Are you specifically talking about through the residential retrofit program that we're hoping to implement? Because some of the work that you, if we're developing research, that's a benefit for everybody and we make sure that it's applied and applicable to everybody. Um, is that mine? I'm so sorry. Sorry, I thought I'd turned it off. <laughs> exactly, that's why I hesitated. I apologize. I'm so sorry. Um, um, and so in terms of research, that benefits everyone. In terms of the, uh, for example, the EV, the road mapping and the infrastructure charging, that's a plan that has a regional application. So the consultation is done with each local government to make sure that their needs are met. So there's an explicit attempt to make sure that we incorporate Souk, Machosan, Highlands, Victoria, Sandwich, everyone's input and develop a program that everybody's happy with. So it's all open and transparent. And that's what I expect moving forward with the new initiatives over the five-year plan. Yeah. 
Anything else, Councillor McMath? Are you complete, Councillor McMath? She's, she's done. She's muted. I think so. Okay. Anything else from members of council? Um, so this will come up uh, later on in our agenda tonight. So thank you, Mr. Harris, for joining us tonight and for making your travels out and for doing the presentation and answering all the questions. One takeaway that I'm going to leave with you is many CRD employees have reached out to me. Um, strong desire to work from home given the flooding, the impact on gas, impact of just the congestion. We're doing a lot of road work here. It's going to get heavy in the next little bit when we hit paving. And the highway work is still ongoing. And their work from home requests are being denied. So managers seemingly have a lot of flexibility. The employees don't. And they're suffering. They're having a really rough time right now. So I'm using every opportunity I can to hit up the employers and the core that I know that are making their employees punch in physically to work, know that you need to cut them a break right now. It's a rough time. Yeah. I'll take that message back for sure. I can assure you that there's no preferential treatment between exempt and unionized staff, and we're all required to be in there, and especially for the delivery of the services. But I'll certainly take that message back, something that we're cognizant. And I know the, the, the board and the executive are thinking about where they're going to have that conversation as we move forward. I have parents in tears. Like, it's, it's a struggle right now. Yeah. And they're getting up early. They're running on fumes. They're doing everything they can. They've, they find, they told me all about the farms. Like I know a lot about what happens there now and it's rough. So just, I'm gonna be doing everything I can, every microphone I have that less car off the road and the employees have proven they can work. It helps ease it all up. It's z net zero because they're working from home. So that's my takeaway. Well, when you're working from home, you're not, ex depending on your house, you're not having to drive. One less car on the road. Yeah. I took the EV vehicle out tonight, but next time I'll look forward to a virtual presence here. There you go. We have the technology, as you can see. So thank you so much. Safe travels back. No, we appreciate your support and attention. And so we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Harris. Drive safe. Okay, Council. So we're back into our agenda here, and we're in item 10 now, public question and comment period. So we have one remaining member of the public, any, you're good? Okay, just checking. And for those viewing online, we have one member of the public remaining, thank you, and uh, who does not wish to speak to speak. So move on to our consent agenda, item 11. There's one item and that is that 11.1 .1 be adopted by general consent. Moved by councillors, who's listening? Thank you, Councillor Bateman, and seconded by Councillor Beddoes for paying attention, thank you. Uh, all those in favor, please. And that's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to item 12 is uh, for information, FCM resolutions. We do have a deadline approaching ahead of the AGM, so there is still time. Um, Councillor McMath just let us know she had lost audio. Just oh, go. Councillor McMath, you've lost audio? Okay, she's not hearing me, so there's something going on there. Thank you, Councillor Logans. I'll have IT connect with her on that. So meanwhile, we still have quorum, so we have the report here. There is a deadline approaching, but at this time, the recommendation is to receive the report for information. It's just in front of you if you want to move on something, okay? Move for information. Thank you by Councillor Logans, seconded by Councillor Beddoes. Any discussion? All in favor? And that's unanimous, thank you. Next up is an interesting one, 12.2, acceptance of art. Yeah. Turn this over to, well, I'll give a bit of an intro. So, council, as you may know, we, um, we love our arts and we also supported a trial with the municipal arts function of the CRD. And in doing so, the Soup Fine Arts Society was successful in a grant application. So this led to a, uh, an event this summer where youth were able to come out and do a, um, a workshop and learn about street art. And there was the winner, the youth, the winner in the youth category of the si Soup Fine Arts show of a year or two years ago was out, as well as some other experienced artists and who guided the youth, but basically gave them the freedom to 
express themselves outside and, and have fun. And it was well attended and well enjoyed. So at the end of the day, there were a few pieces that were left over. And I thought one of them was pretty cool. And I thought, hey, that might be kind of neat to have in our council chambers. So me and my, I'm like, OK, without knowing, like, yeah, let's get the art. Let's hang it up. Let's do this. And then we have a policy. So now I'm going to turn it over to our corporate officer. Nothing is easy. Sorry to interrupt. Could we have a pee break real quick, just so that um, Councilor McMath can join in on this one, potentially? Can I call it a health break? Five minute health break? Can I call oh, it a did health I call break? It a pee break? <laughs> you need whatever you want in the health break. Keep it to yourself. So we are going to take a five minute health break, and I'll see you back at 846. We'll get the IT sorted then. And then it'll start off with a report from our corporate officer. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us now?
Come on, we're back. We, let's get rolling here. Hello. Councillor McMath is back online. Over to our corporate officer, please, regarding the policy. Stop talking. Thank you. Save it for after the meeting. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Your Worship. So attached to the staff report in the agenda package um, is our almost 20-year-old policy that I think a lot of people had forgotten about. Um, it provides specific um, direction to a specific member of our community to head up a art jury and that has since been overlapped with the terms of reference for the SPA committee. Um, so in light of that, this of course has been prioritized to be brought forward as a revised policy or renewed policy uh, in the new year. But in the interim, um, we are recommending that Council suspend the outdated policy and in the spirit of the policy, ask the SPA committee to look at, evaluate and receive the artwork for, on behalf of the district and make that recommendation to Council. Okay, thank you. I'll just note that we didn't do that with the two new pieces that are up here, nor with any of the other artwork that is currently displayed here now. So we know about that, um, but at one time when council chambers in recent years was painted, we changed out the art and we, it was largely um, picked on things that would fit and had, were cohesive and nice. And, uh, and then the two pieces we also added. Um, so, and I get it, I get what you're saying, but uh, we haven't followed the policy on anything that's in here. I can't speak to that, but I do know that in 2017, uh, the art inventory was prepared, and I believe that had the involvement with the SPA committee, as that is in their terms of reference. Okay. And I believe the two new ones are the only one I can recall receiving since then, and I do believe that was a, a little bit different scenario as they were in memory of... Uh, past counselor so yeah um, so I'm fine with that um, if we do this though and we and the spa committee I mean obviously we'll give a recommendation back to council then part of this when I met with the spa committee about those two pieces is that they were meant to hang together so this is the feedback that if this is rolling forward to the spa that might come back from some of the members there so before we had the committee reconfigured um, I sort of took over where our late councillor Parkinson was in terms of having the meetings. So these two pieces and questions were meant to be displayed together and also have sort of a descriptor that says it's, it should be one stroke, uh, one color, one community, something to that effect, Canada Day of 2019 and just a little description. So they had said, suggested to put them together and then have that descriptor between the two. So that should happen. Uh, and then we could also then that would make room for this piece to go up on our wall as well. So that is the takeaway is that these two should go over there and uh, with the descriptor piece below it's just something printed and framed and then we can have that the other artwork added. Questions from members of council? You can see the artwork in here. Councillor Bateman. Yeah, I, I'm just thank, thanks to whoever this young artist is. We don't have a name here. Um, but hopefully thanks will go out to this individual. There were several involved in the creation several. of it. That's yeah. why I thought it's, yeah. it's several suit yeah. areas. And I look forward it to it replacing, perhaps, you know, swapping out a few of these, um, which have been up here forever. And this, this is a modernist or postmodernist or something, um, beautiful piece of art. I also just wanted to note that there are two more days left in this auction by the suit Fine Arts Society for three uh, paintings that come from that youth exhibit, including one that features Suki Sam. And um, yeah, thank you to Suk Fine Arts. Ms. Moore. Yeah. Questions, others from members of council? So the recommendation here is that council refer the acceptance of the Souk Fine Arts Society recently gifted artwork to the Souk Program of the Arts Committee to make a recommendation on acceptance in the spirit of the Municipal Art Display Collection Policy 2.2. 
that council suspend the application of municipal art display collection policy 2.2 until a new policy is adopted by council and that council direct staff to draft a new municipal art display collection policy. We have a mover by Councillor Lajeunesse and seconded by Councillor Logans. Anything on the motion? Councillor McMath, now that you can hear us? Nope. Anything? Nope. Nope. Okay, all those in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, this brings us to 12.3. And this here is um, just following our delegation in the presentation tonight. Uh, this is referred out to all member municipalities. Uh, it does require two thirds, I believe, of municipalities to endorse it in order for it to pass at the CRD. So now uh, this is here in front of us. Can I move it to get it on the table? Yep. Yeah. So that is being moved by Councillor Bateman that Council consent to the CRD adopting bylaw number 4468 Capital Regional District Climate Action and Adaptation Service Establishment Bylaw 2008 Amendment Bylaw number 2 2021 moved by Councillor Bateman and seconded by Councillor Bateman. <laughs> Pardon me, moved by Councillor Bateman and seconded by Councillor Beddows. Did I say that twice? I thought I heard it twice. Good. Go ahead, Councillor Bateman, with the microphone on. It's just a totally logical, evolving process, perhaps not as urgent as it needs to be, and yet it's, these are steps forward and uh, there's a process here and so we're making good progress and i think that the, the these new positions that the crd will have will will be able to advise and assist our climate action coordinator as she uh, gets gets her feet wet wrong expression after the flight <laughs> yeah. i've been trying to eliminate that expression but um you know it's interesting to read here that mayor evans uh, first moved um this uh, service establishment bylaw back in 2008 and Councillor Casper seconded it. And um, yeah, and, and I think that one key point I wanted to make, and it's, it's a minor one, you know, we've indicated in the staff report that the um, increase to the average Souk household will be uh, $7.61. Um, and that's based on the CRD average. I think in Souk, given our average house assessment is around was around 5.30 last year, it would be more likely this would cost us about five dollars and fifty or sixty cents per household as a requisition lift. The end. Depends on how assessed values jump. So. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe we'll say based on last year. Based on last yes. year. Yes. Other comments? Councillor Beddows is a seconder. Yeah, I, uh, I really did enjoy the presentation. Um, there was a couple of key things that he said there, and that was, uh, you know, be careful not to get too far ahead of ourselves, uh, that we need to act in unison. And unfortunately, and uh, I understand some of the councillors concerned about not going far enough, uh, you know, we sort of have to go in unison with the province and the feds. And they're talking about us being slow. They're even slower, but I'm optimistic that, and you know, with what's been going on lately, I think they'll be moving at a, at a more rigorous pace. So uh, I'm I'm very pleased with this. Um, I think it's heading in the right direction. Uh, can it go farther? Probably, and will it in the future? Probably, but uh, I think it's a good start. So I'm all in favor of it. Thanks, Councillor Beddoes. Other comments, Councillor Logans. Um, yeah, I won't be voting in favor of it. I think it's um, it's not where I would like to see it at all. I would like I would prefer that the CRD take a role of change management and help educate the public and um, and support municipalities in more aggressive change rather than just doing these lip service things piecemeal here, there, and everywhere. Um, I understand that EVs are are going to be built into our economy very quickly, but you can't plug into an EV charger if you live in a home that you can't afford to retrofit uh, for an EV charger, if you, can't afford, or an, if you can't afford an electric vehicle, if you live in a condo building that doesn't have an EV charger. Um, there are so many reasons that this 
especially the transportation piece of this is very elitist and it only widens and promotes the gap of social inequality in our communities, um, which I think is opposite of the role and probably the intent of the CRD document. Um, it, on that note, this to say that something like this achieves the, its goal of climate leadership, I think is really pathetic and I would like to see more from them. Uh, so I'll not be voting in favor of it. Thank you. Other comments? Make, uh, Councillor McMath, any comments? I just don't want to miss you there. You're on mute, though. I can't hear you. I still can't hear you. Sorry, I can hear you. I can see you. Can you hear me? I think so. I just can't hear you. She can call me and then I'll put my Oh, up that's to the a light. good idea. <laughs> Do you want to phone Councillor Logan's? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Where there's a will. I don't know the issue. Who is she phoning? Here it is. Oh, here we go. Can you hear me? Hold yeah, on, I'll turn you can. up. Put her on speaker. I think, go ahead, give it a test. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I have mixed feelings. Um, like I said before, typically in these group projects, Souk always gets left behind, and Souk's climate challenges are different than other municipalities. I do like um, the advocacy pieces that they were speaking to, and I do like the intention of helping municipalities coordinate together, and at the end of the day, it's only five bucks-ish. Um, so for that reason alone, I'll be supporting. Will be supporting. All done? Thank you, Councillor yeah. McMath. Okay. All right, so the recommendation, it's been moved and seconded, so I'll call the question then. All those in favor, please. And opposed, Councillor Logans is opposed. The motion carries. Okay, so moving into our bylaw section, item 13.1, checkout bag regulation bylaw is here at third reading. So, not third reading, we're here at adoption. So here we are, that council adopt the bylaw cited as checkout bag regulation bylaw number 8. 3-1-2021. Moved by Councillor Bateman and seconded by Councillor Beddoes. Any discussion? Go ahead, Councillor Bateman. Yeah, just a, a quick note um, in relation to some social media I've been reading about this, this regulation. And just to be clear, um, for those who don't understand it, this, this regulation eliminates plastic checkout bags. That's the focus of it. Uh, small plastic bags can be utilized in a wide variety of common sense situations, bulk foods, fruit and vegetables, hardware supplies, newspapers. Um, and you will be able to purchase plastic bags sold in multiple units, such as kitchen catchers and garbage bags. So. Yes, yeah, so we know many of our local businesses have already trans begun their transition and then COVID kind of threw all that out and we couldn't bring our bags in anymore and now some are starting to bag in your bag and others require you to still bag. It's just the, re it's just the way it is and we can do this. We can bag our groceries. I'm sure we can. Let's help out our frontline workers here. Okay, so moved and seconded. All those in favor, please. That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. 13.2, five-year financial plan bylaw number 826. I was a bit puzzled about this because aren't we meeting to deal with this tomorrow? Oh, okay, go ahead, Kim. Ms. Gray. Uh, through your worship, this is uh, the amendment of the current financial plan, the 2021 to 2025 financial plan. Um, so there was, there's not a formal presentation for this. This is just a more of a formality because uh, council uh, throughout the year um, made various resolutions that uh, materially impacted the um, not the property tax side of the budget, but the other pieces of the budget. So um, just for clarity and transparency, just requesting council support to officially amend the bylaw and give it for three readings at this time. Okay, thank you for that. That makes sense. 
all in the staff report. Thank you, Ms. Gray. Tomorrow will be a lot more fun. Okay, excellent. <laughs> I was thinking maybe we're just going to get through it all tonight. We'll need the special council meeting tomorrow. Oh, okay. Never mind. Okay, so here we are, and it is that council give first, second, and third reading to the bylaw cited as five-year financial plan amendment bylaw number 826-799-01-2021. And if I said the numbers wrong, it's because I don't have my glasses and the screen isn't on the right one. It's not my fault. And because it's not 8675 Okay. So... <laughs> It moved by Councillor Logans and seconded by Councillor Bettos. I thought it just went way over my head, but thank you. Okay. Any discussion? It's all on the staff report. Okay. All those in favor, please. And that's unanimous. Thank you. No new business. And so that brings us to this correspondence here. And I just, this came out from the ministry about some changes that they are looking at doing. It's always local government's fault for holding up housing supply. However, uh, maybe, they, maybe some are and some aren't, but they are looking to put different pieces together here and this impacts our operations in terms of how public notices happen, public hearings, code of conduct, and so forth. So just felt that um, it was timely uh, Councillor Bateman asked a few questions about some items that we had earlier. Would these come before Council or not? We know that SUC is unique, so it sort of depends, but there are some pieces in here, and I just felt that um, uh, with some folks uh, concerned about development and the like, the province also really wants to get units uh, in to meet the growing demands of our community. So in some cases, they are exerting the provincial authorities that they have that puts pressure on local governments. So I just felt that uh, this should get out into the public realm here. So I'll just leave it at that discussion. Any questions or anything further, Mr. McKinnis, to add on this? No, most of the pieces that we are waiting for regulations early in 2022. So the regulations uh, will really dictate what we can and can't do and then uh, we'll have to bring bylaws in front of our council. Have they given a sense of when in 2022, like quarter one or two? Uh, I'm just looking on the uh, public notice here. It says uh, the changes will be brought into force by regulation in 2022, so. Councillor Bateman? Yeah, so I think Soup deserves a bit of credit for the first item, which is the public notice. Um, it was Britt Santowski first brought this to, to Council and then we put through a, through a resolution to AVIC and here it is three years later coming through so that uh, we as a district get to determine how we, we promote um, as uh, currently strictly through the Soup News Mirror. Then the code of conduct is, is fascinating and um, councils are being asked to, you could probably speak to that, I'd like to hear more because under your watch at UBCM, I think that came forward. But the one that interests me is this public hearings for zoning amendments and um, as I understand it, there will be no need for public hearings for zoning bylaw amendments that are consistent with the OCP. And however, local governments um, do have the option to hold a public hearing on a zoning bylaw that is consistent with the OCP if they choose. Um, so I, I understand at the Land Use and Development Committee meeting, there was, it was quite a, a lively conversation. So through you to Mr. Paolo, could you give us a summary of the kind of feedback you heard? Specifically to the public hearings yeah. portion? I think you mentioned Perhaps significant in the sense that um, just getting a better understanding from the province as to what the intent of this change uh, entails because currently uh, we have the ability to waive the requirement for a public hearing if it's consistent with the official committee plan. Uh, the way that we are interpreting these changes is that uh, by default a local government is not required to hold a public hearing. So the essence of what is trying to be accomplished it, it still remains the ability to not hold a public hearing on a zoning bylaw amendment. Um, what we would like is further clarity as to that, that process. The provision exists currently, re regardless of these proposed amendments, but just understanding the true intent of, of how this speeds up the process, 
uh, for going through. The Land Use and Development Committee uh, provided a lot of comment and support for having those public input opportunities, such as a public hearing. Uh, discussion uh, surrounded the support for waiving the public hearing if there was a prior public uh, opportunity for input, such as applicant is going to be putting in a, a permit. They themselves hold a public information session like we have done with other applications, and then that way the public becomes informed of the application. But ultimately, the committee would still like some form of a, of a public input venue. And so most, um, um, most planning departments would probably agree that the public hearing process is the most uh, open and transparent way uh, of allowing that. It's very common for, for many jurisdictions and their planning departments to, to receive that input to ultimately inform council of what the public uh, sees either in support or in opposition of an application. So there really wasn't much in terms of overall support other than this seems to be a provision that exists, just how, how does this wording alter that timeline for waiving or not holding the public hearing. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just, and th this is going to reveal my ignorance yet again. Um, so a new OCP comes in, we get a new zoning bylaw as is automatically required as a result of a new OCP. And that zoning bylaw determines zones and land use throughout the district <coughs> of Souk. Therefore, why would there be any zoning bylaw amendments or rezonings? at all over the lifespan of an OCP. So when a uh, official community plan is updated, uh, staff will undertake the process of updating other bylaws and policies to be consistent with any changes necessary. But that does not uh, preclude other properties in future from going through a process of changing their zoning to ideally be something that is supportable through OCP policy. But we will not take the initiative of rezoning other people's properties to become consistent with uh, a mapping designation that might uh, be a new uh, land use being proposed in the OCP. So what we're doing is just making sure procedurally that our zoning bylaw matches up with the uh, official community plan. The mapping amendments, the rezonings, the map changes, those would be applicant driven and so that's that's where you would see in future somebody coming in perhaps rezoning land in the town center to an appropriate uh, zoning that would be consistent with the town center land use designation and its respective policies so there will still be those rezoning scenarios I think I understand but it's been now <laughs> it's a long just, iterative process I'll just give you an answer there Councillor Bateman it's just I'm coughing because I'm smelling some fumes that uh -oh. are coming in here. So I don't, I don't know what it is or where it's coming from, but it's just making me cough. So that's mm -hmm. why I'm coughing because I'm just smelling something. Anyway, maybe it's me. Um, but an example would be, so let's say there's houses. As we know, we have houses yeah. in the town centre yeah. that are zoned residential. And our OCP wants that to be um, mixed use with retail and live above. So if we made that happen, those residents will be assessed on best and highest use. And mortgages, insurance, all of that, whereas they just want to live in their house. Mm -hmm. But the OCP in the future, like if there's land assembly occurring, identifies that as something else. So that's where you want that developer who then does that to pay those fees to rezone it, not the current homeowner that just wants to live in their house until whenever. Right, so if we made it all change where you don't have to rezone, then all the homes, like they're, they're like, but I'm not living in an industrial base. I'm just living in my house. Or you, know, you can see how that would happen um, because they would be assessed on highest and best use. As opposed to, or let's say you need a residential, you have a residential mortgage. Um, there's a house fire, you can't rebuild your house because the zoning requires you you know, we made an OCP with this zoning, you have a fire, and now you can't rebuild your house, you have to rezone it down to a single family unit when you, like too bad, so sad. So that's, I think that's a fair description. That's where that the OCP lays out designations, but then 
how are we going to get the fees and charges to do the business we need to do if I think the developers would love it if they never had to pay for any rezoning or go through that process it's all spelled out that we wouldn't receive that revenue it would all go on taxpayers now to, to pay that because we would lose all those fees too another critical piece is the ability to register covenants prior to the adoption of, of that zoning change so that's where we have the opportunity to implement the necessary uh, procedures through the development permit or the building permit stage to require that applicant to provide amenities, land acquisition components, whatever is decided uh, at staff or ultimately a request of council through the public hearing process to then require that as a covenant piece. Staff confirms that's been registered on title now and then council can follow through with final adoption of that and then the zoning change occurs and then it proceeds through the following development permit and building permit processes. So there, there's a huge legal uh, tool that's available through the covenant process with rezonings as well. And then lastly, with this Councillor Bateman, so this is sort of the work of, you know, with UBCM, it's representing all 189 local governments. So sometimes it's hard to see our local government in this when it's a response to all local governments with a diverse range of issues around the province. And so what it shows is that the province is, is listening and wanting to work with us. So in some areas when there was a lot of discussion around you need to get the housing supply flowing and I'm saying we're doing it. We just need to catch up the infrastructure. So it's not really fair to point at us. Whereas other local governments would say, well, we're trying to, but every time we have a public hearing, everyone shows up and they shut it down. And if we don't, then they throw everyone out of office who listens and then they can never get anywhere. So in, in some communities, that's an issue. That's a barrier or those elected officials are saying that that is a problem in their communities. It may not be in ours, but it is in other places. In terms of the code of conduct, it came out of a lot of discussion around responsible conduct. Uh, we're doing well, I think, uh, governing, working well with administration. Uh, hasn't always been the case here and certainly in, in some jurisdictions they don't want to come back in person because they didn't get along before COVID, during COVID and certainly not after COVID. Mm. I hear of people physically assaulting each other in camera meetings and a lot of just despair and good people are like no more of this and others are saying I don't know on any of our all. So that's happening. It's been a tough time uh, and I'm proud of the work that we're doing here together and, and staying together and working together. That isn't the case elsewhere. And uh, so part of it is, okay, what can the province do? Well, in some cases, they're limited. This is people and it's all of that together. You can offer education, people don't go. You can say you need to do these things, nobody goes. You can here sign a code of conduct, well, last council did this, whatever, it doesn't mean anything. Well, now they wanted to actually have some strength in this, which is why this is occurring. And it has to, you know, if we do it, the next council, and next council could say, oh, that doesn't represent us, we don't like it. Said, whatever, we'll sign it. I mean, certainly we had a policy, we signed it, it was okay. This actually requires every local government within six months, they have to sit together and figure it out. So it, it puts everyone in that uh, way, but it, it's, been a ch it's two years of work at the UBCM, uh, a, a lot of discussion back and forth, and, and you hear a lot of the frustrations that, um, that folks are feeling, and, it, and it's tough. So it's, it's kind of a best effort. So in some cases, when they come back for more, it's seeking out what really works for us here. Uh, a lot of parts with the public hearing process, um, is it also it's a good opportunity to inform the community of what's going on in the public. It is a very transparent way of doing that. And it's all in the open and, and folks can come in or not. So it, there's a lot, but that's where it's sometimes it's, uh, we advocate for this, the province says, okay, we'll do this. And then we have to find, find ourselves in that. But you're right about the AVIC one. That was, uh, Sue brought that forward. Yeah. It was endorsed at UBCM and three years later, so. <laughs> There's a lot of other things, but it's moving. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, so good discussion. So right now, um, the motion is then that council received the correspondence dated October 29, 2021 from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs for information, please. Moved by Councillor Beddoes, seconded by Councillor Lajeunesse. Anything from anyone else? 
see none all in favor then and that's unanimous thank you and council verbal reports go ahead councillor Beddoes. Uh, sort of not one of my duties but i did uh, attend a uh, christmas bureau meeting uh, the other day and uh, I could say they really would like to move away from food donations to money. Uh, the community um, is actually hurting. Uh, the pressures on food, as you know, in a grocery store, if you can find any from the hoarders, uh, is out of reach for a lot of people. And the food bank is, uh, you know, in my opinion, doing a wonderful job in meeting uh, that. And they, they're okay. They're in good shape. Uh, they appreciate our help with those uh, Coupon or those gift cards for those drivers. Again, they're going to deliver the hampers, uh, and it's cheaper than have everybody come in there and try and get them. So uh, yeah, they're working really hard, and uh, it, it's good to see that. Um, go ahead and put another. You know, I'm in that community hall. I see the food bank. I see the loan cupboard. I see the Meals on Wheels. We've got some great organizations in this town that are serving these people, and uh, it's it's very refreshing to see that. But. Uh, Christmas Bureau was one. I was very pleased with them. So, for what it's worth. Thank you, Councillor Beddoes. Other comments? Councillor Lajeunesse? Yeah, well, uh, this afternoon I, or this morning, I attended the South Island Prosperity Partnership's uh, local um, leadership event uh, for uh, Rising Economy Week. Um, and 100% of the conversation centered around climate action. And uh, this was a meeting, I'm not sure, 100 people probably, uh, local leadership, municipal leadership, and business leaders. And there were some very good discussions. Uh, one of the main points was that uh, it's about education and starting kind of a grassroots movement, but it's encouraging to see that uh, local leadership as well as local business leadership are viewing climate action as a major issue. And I'm not, <laughs> I think it's obvious why that's become such an issue of late, um, but uh, I was encouraged by by what I was hearing at that uh, at that event, and I'm sure that there will be much more discussion in that regard. Thank you, <clears throat> Councillor Bateman. Yep. And I believe you were one of the organizers of today's session, were you not? Oh, I thought you were. <laughs> I saw <Incredible>. that. <laughs> You're listed as one of them. <laughs> anyway, okay. Uh, so. Uh, on Saturday, we had the second of the Sioux Homelessness Coalition strategic plan sessions. Um, and we had the West Coast Medical Clinic's Dr. Jeff Pocock um, gave the keynote speech. Um, he provides addictions counseling at the Hope Center. And then we got busy identifying actions in five specific areas. Um, turnout this time is about 25 individuals, including our CAO, Norm McInnes, who who was there at the first session and the second session, and I've just been transcribing some of the session um, actions on um, uh, collaboration and leadership, and, and Mr. McKinnis came up with some really wonderful ideas. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, I won't go any further on that. That we'll be reporting out w with uh, with those recommendations. Um, one of the key things is, is peer support and engagement by a new acronym for me, PWLLE, which is people with lived and living experiences. So at the, at the session, we had, um, I think, two or, two or three people who, who, one guy was living in his SUV. He's a former government employee and lost his job recently and can't afford rent. So he's in his SUV and he was parked in the Baptist Church parking lot and he popped in and we welcomed him. And he, he you know, the realities people are facing. Another guy's been living under the bridge and uh, now is tenting near the Hope Center so that he can access services. But the Hope Center, of course, the 33 uh, spaces they can, they can fill are filled. 
So he's hoping, I don't know, I guess it's day to day for so many of these people. And it's good that uh, this group of citizens and frontline workers primarily were in the room on Saturday. And they've, they've got some great ideas that require funding, energy, time, resources, and all the rest of it. And the other thing I did was attended a BC Hydro session um, last week on its proposed new rate structure which will go to the BC Utilities Commission in the spring. Basically, they want to eliminate the two-step two program, which, um, you know, if you're using a lot of energy, you're going to pay more for it, and it reintroduce the flat rate for all BC Hydro customers, along with a new wrinkle of time of use rates so that people are shifting away from the peak period, 4 p.m. to 11 p.m., and plugging their EVs in, for example, before bedtime. Um, rather than when they return from work. And the intention with this, back to climate action, is to promote energy conservation and encourage more people to make the switch to heat pumps and EVs, um, which will generate larger, larger bills, so hence the flat rate. Um, yeah. So that's it. That, that'll be coming forward with lots of media coverage in, in the coming months. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for sending those details, Councillor Bateman. It's a bit worrisome because for families and those working, 4 to 11 is your peak time. You know, it's like, okay, I'll fire up the, you know, it drives my household crazy, maybe others too, maybe it's just my house, but I start both the, the laundry and the dishwasher before we go to bed. Like, nobody can sleep with all of that going on, and they're pretty quiet appliances, so you try to find other times to do it, but sometimes, I don't want to do the laundry. Like, you got to get stuff ready for kids to go to school the next day. Like, yeah. it, it, it's, it's tough, right? Um, yeah, especially for those working that, you know, you come home and you need to do all these things. Yeah, no question. You know? However, there is this time of use, as you say, and you know, we have to question our privileges a little more as we move forward d to deal with, with this climate emergency. I suppose, but people yeah, can only afford so many pieces of clothing and so many... Oh, I know, it's, it's not easy. Sportwear and but we are in the first no, world the here. That has to shut off their power for days yeah. at a time. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's fine, I hear your point. But yeah. It's fine. Uh, okay. Interesting. So it would basically, we're all going to pay more for hydro, is what I see, and they have an endless supply as everything is moving to hydro and as the preferred energy choice. So it's interesting that um, you'd think that the rates would actually come down, but they probably won't. It would be a very mild increase over a five to ten year period. Right. That was the whole tier one, tier two, smart meter, all that stuff. I remember the protests that we had here in Souk during EVIC for that. and. Everything they said then is not played out, but hmm. thank you for going nonetheless. Okay. I appreciated the information. Yes, we thank you for that. Okay, so moving on, I was uh, very pleased to be at the uh, Legion on Remembrance Day to lay our wreath on behalf of the District of Souk. Uh, and also, uh, I'll leave it at that, we do have our Santa Parade in the works that's coming, so more details on that to come, I would imagine. And uh, I just want to thank Council for uh, just giving me a bit of support here. I am a member of the Sandwich Generation, so when I look at Envy at a minivan, like clearly something's going on. Like usually people don't want one of those, but I think, wow, you can fit a wheelchair, you can fit gear, I can fit, you know, all my family and a dog and groceries in that thing, because right now it was thanks to Councillor Beddoes I'm trying to pack all this stuff into my little car. I did get it all in there. Yeah, you did well. Yeah. You know, I was surprised, but uh, it all fit in the end. But trying to fit it, you know, when you have a car seat and you have other things, it, it, it's not easy to fit a lot into a vehicle. Uh, but it is what it is. So just thank you for that. And then with Councillor Lajeunesse, I did go to the Rising Economy uh, forum for this morning. We left after lunch and it was my pleasure to introduce uh, Chief Planis, who was our lunch uh, over our uh, keynote just before lunch and he gave a really excellent talk as he always did. He shared a bit of oral history where he said that elders had spoken of the Thunderbird lifting the orca, out of, orca and salmon out of the water in uh, years past and basically what that is is there was a big flooding event here. Uh, is what that is saying. And so elders have warned of this 
and, and here we are now. So there is so much to learn in, in the Indigenous worldview of, of just understanding what those messages are. He did uh, talk a lot about the messaging to young people and for young people learning to respect natural places and what that messaging means. And also just reminding us that humans are not number one. We're a part of the overall system. We all have our place, but we're not the number one top of the totem pole. In fact, sometimes the humans are not even on the totem pole at all. Uh, he reminded us to take time to walk through the forest, uh, to look at the vegetation and to see the, the various animals, the shnakwa or the herons as they protect and overlook village sites. And then he also talked about the challenges uh, that they face, the damage done to the territory uh, and, and their drive to look at seven generations and opportunities for children. So what really struck me in his discussion is every problem they outlined they've created a solution that creates employment and opportunity and learning for young people. And so that's the real exciting piece is he's not there to lay blame. This is the reality of what's occurred. Here's what they need to do going forward. So he talked about there's five buoys with sensors in the waterways checking temperature, acidification levels, movement and the like in our waterways and there's young people monitoring these. Uh, and going out and seeing them. So he talks about the derelict vessels that are here, the damage to eelgrass, but how that can create a, a watch uh, type of system, again, for younger people. And just the shoreline cleanup where they picked out 20 tons of metal, and I think it was 14 different types of garbage that was identified. Several more tons in the past year, oil spill response, and then discussion on um, marine stewardship and, and some further work that they're doing. So I think that's where it's always inspiring uh, to hear and learn from Chief Planis is just how they, they see a problem, they find a solution and how they're working through it and the opportunities. But he also shared some of their challenges of how they receive just short funding so they can do this pilot or this pilot or this pilot. And it's more longer term thinking so that these become more permanent things and not just one-time thing, so it's it's an ongoing challenge there. But it was, it was a privilege to introduce him. And uh, earlier in the day, we did hear uh, the mayor of Glasgow had joined virtually. So just um, talked a bit about uh, what's occurred in Glasgow recently, and then we she shared a little bit that struck me on how do you get folks to um, uh, to be climate leaders. So number one, make it easy. Uh, number two, people need to see the change to, to believe it. So they talked a lot about putting employment and workplaces near the people. And then they talked a bit about stick measures. So they use London as an example where they implemented a congestion toll. Uh, so yes, you can drive through London, but you're going to pay to do it. And that toll then goes directly into funding public transit and the focus is on the health of the people because they shared that the air quality for children and with all of that in London was um, the asthma rates were extremely high and the impact on school children. So that was the approach. Um, she did share that Glasgow doesn't have that stick but it's certainly pieces that they're looking for. So it was wonderful that she was able to join us virtually in that way and uh, appreciated Councillor Lajeunas driving because it was his fuel and not mine but thank you. <laughs> It just makes me worried when you know, like, you know, I have a household, I need a father who may need emergency services, I don't want to have to worry about finding gas. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's really... And that's the first time in my life, a lot of it, than most of you, I've never yeah. seen gas stations run out of gas. No, and I was fortunate to fill up when I did, but it's, uh, okay, you know, and I have a small car, it probably take, it doesn't take 30 liters, so it's probably have to fill it up anyway, but... It, it is a tough time, and I did pitch there to all the employers that were in the room, let your employees work from home right now. <laughs> it's ridiculous. In some places, we have yeah, really. just getting the dialogue. Some employees have to go over the Malahat every day and punch in. Uh, and the Malahat was shut again today. So imagine the stress that puts on people. So I'm glad that we're having some flexibility here. And I certainly hope that some of the core, it picked up some traction on Twitter, are listening because right now people just need a bit of a break. And if they can work from home successfully, they should be able to do it. Forcing folks to come in and out in these uncertain times is just, it actually just makes me very angry. 
How well are you going to function at work when you're that stressed getting there and you're getting up at 5 o'clock to plan your day? And that's a long day. You're not getting home till close to 6 or 7 at night. And that is life for commuters in Souk right now, and it's awful. So I'll stop talking about it. Okay. On that note, motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Councillor Beddoes. Uh, sorry, Seconded may by I? Councillor Lajeunesse. Sorry. Oh, oh sorry. I missed you, Councillor McMath. Where are you? Oh. That's okay. <laughs> I'm somewhere. I can't even see you. God, that is a really close cool hey. You're like on the big screen now, all of them. Ooh. Too much. Okay. <laughs> um, just really briefly, I on uh, November 18th went to the emergency management conference call uh, with the four ministers, and uh, it was ju just a brief update for the provincial state of emergency from the weather situation. And one of the takeaway pieces, which you were just touching on, was how essentially the impact of media created that gas shortage. And so public education and sort of communities brainstorming about what is the best way to use those media outlets in a productive and, dare I say, intelligent way on educating the public. So this mini disaster that happened, it was isolated to a specific area. It wasn't an international incident. So when people are panicking about gas shortages, it's the explanation that there are transportation pinch points that were created and now there are alternate routes being taken so there isn't a shortage there's just a delay um uh, one of the other pieces that came from it was using um their initial response was the province wanted to install police officers at gas stations <laughs> uh and then so then what was learned that they could work with gas stations um with their their gas pumps and the technology so that they could set caps on those things. So it's an awful event to go through, but it, what it was great for was opening communities eyes into how emergency preparedness is so important and how we're really not prepared. Um, the communities that are going to feel the harshest um, residual pain from this um, are the farming communities. And so the, Ministers have said that they will come back with updates on how they're going to support um, those small local vendors because there's been severe, severe losses and they're still um, they're still working on plans to help support those farmers with um, just a mass rate of bovine death, their equipment that's been completely destroyed, the manpower that they need and, and just getting those resources organized. So the one positive takeaway was that there were all these beautiful stories of people coming together in communities like Souk is famous for and how they supported each other and how they got together while these larger bodies are working to figure out plans. Um, so there were some really beautiful stories out of that. Um, but definitely takeaway piece is public education when there are times of stress and Facebook is notorious for creating that negative sensationalization of things that are not entirely accurate. So that was a, a takeaway piece that perhaps in the future we can look at working with our media outlets too to just educate our community on what's really going on. Thank you for that, Councillor McMath. And I'll just add because, um, you know, I came home and I had to do some shopping and, as I, and I, I stopped in a few places and I could feel the tension that uh, people were going through that day. And when you start chatting with people, because I was in the checkout line for over an hour, uh, many were the case where, and I kind of wonder myself is, there's sales right now, so while we can, we're going to save some money on groceries are expensive, as Councillor Beddoes has said. They have gone up, and the concern for many is that, okay, right now, these are the prices. They're going to jack them next week. So some people were buying more just to save money in the future for what may be a forecast, because you're hearing of pricing increases. Uh, so there is certainly a reason I was motivated to buy things that I could on sale because I can save some money right now because everything is going up in price and people are not making more. We're all just doing more with less. Uh, I have to pay out more with less. So a lot of that was people stocking up and taking advantage of sales um, and right now getting a break because everything's costing more money. Just on a side note, uh, with the Christmas Bureau, they may not have turkeys this year. Yeah. They'll, they'll give food, 
but yeah. uh, with the Lilydale factory in uh, the Lower Mainland and all those turkey farms that uh, Councillor St. Pierre and I went and saw, uh, drowned a lot of birds. I found out that many in my family don't actually like turkey. After all this time! <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to our motion to adjourn. I believe it's been moved and seconded, so thank you for, for that, Councillor McMath. Glad we could hear you there. You continue to be safe, and thank you for all you're doing, as well as everyone else here and all of our businesses. Uh, many are like, no, we're, we have gas. We're selling it at regular price. We're not gouging. They've been communicating out with the customers and many residents banding together. Uh, it's just remarkable. So thank you to all. Call the question on adjournment. All in favor? That's unanimous. Have a good night, everyone, and we'll see you tomorrow at 6 o'clock. Oh, it's 6.